Okay, we are live. Let me just check, make sure that the live stream is up. Okay. We are good. Sergeant, will you begin recording? You see recording has started. Start recording rolling. Backup is rolling. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council Remote Hearing on the Committee on Women and Gender Equity jointly with the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic uh, to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, council at testimony.nyc.gov. Share ideas, we are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the Human Services Commission System of Domestic Violence Shelters. I'm Council Member Dama Vanessa Diaz. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I chair the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. We are also joined by Committee on Gender Welfare, which is chaired by my colleague and also Brooklyn Council Member Steve Levin. In addition to the oversight topic, we will also hear Proposed introduction 24-24-8, sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal in relation to establishing a street harassment advisory board. And proposed introduction of 2372, a sponsored bill by Council Member Carolina Rivera in relation to creating a two-year look back window to gender motivated violence act and extending its statute of limitations. During the pandemic, the rate of domestic violence increased by about 8.1%, while movement restrictions were in effect. DV experts cautioned the figure is likely much higher than 8.1%. In New York City, stay at home orders forced many survivors to shelter in place with an abusive partner or family member, further isolating them from supportive systems and seeking services. After initial decrease in the number of requests for DV services, once the city's DV providers shifted to working remotely, the number of survivors reaching out for assistance increased largely. Compared to 2019, city's DV call online increased by 17%. Number of survivors accessing services for the first time at the NYC Family Justice Centers or, J or FJCs increased by 35.8%. Visits to New York City Hope website increased by 267%. Through the DV homicides decreased from 2019 to 2020, there was also an increase of intimate partner relations homicides from 2019 to 2020. The number increased with the previous five-year average of annual IPV homicides. From 2010 to 2020, there were 721 DV homicides of which the majority of victims identified as female, while the majority of IPV homicide victims identified as female, I want to take special note, there is a reference to bill introduction 2379, which is laid over in committee and we required the Department of Social Services to create a DV designated female identifying individuals. That the majority, 57.3% of other family homicide victims identify as male. Compared to other race ethnic groups, a high portion of homicide victims are black. According to 49% of victims homicides, Hispanic, Hispanic individuals account for 28.8% of homicides. Black females sadly affect IPV homicides 29.6% while making up 13% of the city's population. Hispanic females account for 26.6% of IPV homicides while making up 14.6 of the city's population. Additionally, one of every five DV homicides, two out of every five other family homicides involve a child under the age of 10. The committee last met on a hearing city's DV shelters in September of 2019. At that hearing, committees heard survivor testimony about the importance of supportive supports, including for children at DV shelters, and difficult staying in therapy and finding permanent housing upon leaving DV shelter. At, this, at, the at the same time of the hearing, HRE testified 
that had single units for transgender and gender non-conforming non-binary individuals, but were unable to commit whether the, the needs of the LGBTQI plus community as outlined in 2015 plan had come to flourishing. At this hearing, I'm interested in hearing about how the city is handling the needs of DV survivors. Being one, I'm also interested in knowing the assistance is needed greatly. This, this includes access to shelter and appropriate services, to programming and counseling to help survivors and their families get back on their feet, as well as assistance in search for permanent housing. Before we turn to our testimony, I'd like to also acknowledge that, that this is Transgender Awareness Week and tomorrow's Transgender Day of Rep Remembrance, a day to honor the memory of the transgender people whose lives have been lost in acts of anti-gender violence. At this time of the, uh, at the time of writing these remarks, at least 375 transgender people were murdered. This is horrible, incredible. Making 2021 the deadliest year of the violence against gender diverse people in records since records began. However, we know that hate crimes un underreported and the actual number is likely to be much higher. Most of the victims are black and migrant trans women of color and sex workers. In the light of this hearing, one in four were killed in their home. Adios mio. This is unacceptable. Your home is supposed to be your haven. Every single person deserves to be treated with dignity and our world is more beautiful with transgender lives, with transgender individuals in our lives. And they deserve to thrive, not just survive. So today I'm looking forward to hearing how the city is working to best serve trans and gender non-conforming non-binary New Yorkers who are experiencing DV, again, DV domestic violence and gender-based violence. Now, I'd like to thank Terry Cox and my communications legislative director, the Surgery of Arms, who are working very hard to run this hearing and committee staff for their work in preparing these hearings, including Chloe Rivera, the committee senior analyst, and Asia Wright, the finance unit head. I am now turning it over to my colleague, Chair Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Diaz. Uh, good morning and welcome to this joint hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare and Women and Gender Equity. Uh, I wanna thank my co-chair, Dharma Diaz, for organizing this hearing today. And uh, I wanna thank as well, uh, other members of the committee, committee staff and our Sergeant at Arms. The committee will conduct a hearing on the domestic violence system and hear any recent updates regarding resources, program developments, and the effect of the pandemic on this population's need from city services. We will also hear intro 2372, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera in relation to creating a two-year look back window to the Gender Motivated Violence Act and extending its statute of limitations. Domestic violence is frequently cited as the most, cause and most common reason uh, or as one of the most common reasons for those entering the shelter system in New York City. And while we know that HRA's DV shelter system serves thousands of families every year through its emergency and tier two shelters with new capa capacity coming online in recent years. However, the need may be far greater than what we are currently offering. Shortly after the stay at home order was put into place, domestic violence support lines and reports by local police departments responding to domestic violence incidents dramatically increased across the United States and here in New York City. It is important for this committee to hear of whether there is sufficient capacity to meet the needs and explore what, what, uh, what happens when survivors must enter, enter the general homeless shelter system. We need to understand what can be done to enhance domestic violence services especially in accommodating new or shifting needs for families during the pandemic. The committee would like to know of how we may be able to better support those in the existing system and how they are faring at securing safe, permanent and stable housing without having to enter the general DHS system. I wanna thank the advocates and members of the public for joining us today. I wanna to thank representatives from the administration for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from all of you on these critical issues. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, members of the General Welfare Committee who are here, 
um, uh, and other council members as well. Um, we're joined by council member Ben Kalos, uh, council member Savina Brooks Powers, um, going through the council member Carlina Rivera, um, council member Antonio Reynoso, um, council member Helen Rosenthal, and uh, council member Farrah Lewis. And we expect to be joined by um, additional council members throughout the course of the hearing today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, and my co-legislative directors, Elizabeth Adams and Nicole Hunt. I'd also, th also like to thank um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Women's and Gender Equity Committee staff, as well as the General Welfare Committee staff. Um, uh, the General Welfare Committee staff uh, are Amenta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omari, Policy Analyst, and Julia Haramis, Financial Analyst. And with that, I will turn it back over to my co-chair, Dharma Diaz. Thank you. Thank you for, for your deliverance. I'm turning it over to Councilwoman Rosenthal for a statement on her bill. Thank you very much, Council Member Diaz. Good morning. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and my pronouns are she, her. I want to begin by thanking Chairs Diaz and Levin for holding this joint hearing and including my bill, Intro 2424, which will mandate the creation of a street harassment advisory board. Street harassment is an ongoing, widespread, and highly destructive aspect of life in New York City. Catcalling, verbal intimidation, the threat of physical violence, you name it. Street harassment can be based on perceived race or ethnicity, sexual or gender expression, disability, and more. And until now, local government has been reluctant to tackle this issue. My bill, Intro 2424, will mandate the creation of an advisory board, which will begin to examine the question of street harassment and how government can and should respond. The board will collaborate with the Commission on Gender Equity to design and conduct a public survey regarding street harassment in New York City. Based on the survey results and other research and public engagement, the board will prepare an annual report with recommendations or for legislation and policy changes in response to street harassment. My bill also requires that the Commission on Gender Equity develop and post a resource guide for victims of street harassment and that CGE update this resource regularly. Our long-term intent is to support survivors provide public education and identify other evidence and community-based models of combating street harassment and violence. We're interested in alternatives to the traditional tools of more policing, civil penalties, and interactions with the criminal justice system. We have been fortunate to work with and hear from many dedicated advocates, organizations, and peers like Public Advocate Williams. I want to emphasize that this is not the final draft of the legislation. It's a first draft. We're already planning changes related to representation on the advisory board, along with more focus on anti-criminalization. That is why it's so critical we hear from the public today, especially those organizations that understand both the frightening reality of street harassment and the dangers of over-policing. I welcome your feedback. We encourage anyone unable to submit testimony or appear today to please send written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov and to my office, hrosenthal at council.nyc.gov. Thank you so, so much for giving me an opportunity to speak this morning and I'll pass it back to you, Chair Diaz. Thank you, my fellow Rosenthal. I say we're, that, thank you for what you continue to do um, and moving bills forward that, that makes sense. And I look forward to hearing community feedback on, on this bill 
and I'm glad that you did share with us that it was still developing in, within this conversation. I'd like to now turn it over to Councilwoman Rivera for introduction and conversation on her bill. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate uh, this, this brief time to speak on behalf of my bill with Council Member Sylvina Brooks Powers, intro 2372. We introduced this legislation in order to create a two year look back window for survivors of gender motivated violence to file civil actions against their assailants under the Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act of 2000, even if the statute of limitations in the case has already expired. The statute of limitations for filing civil actions under the GMBA in New York City is typically seven years, but many survivors have come forward to tell their stories and seek justice for assaults that unfortunately occurred too far in the past to pursue action under the GMBA in its current form. This legislation offers a path to healing for those who have been failed by the very institutions tasked to protect them. I wanna thank the survivors and advocates who approached me with this proposal last year. And I'm so proud to be championing this legislation alongside such an important ally and leader in this policy space, Councilwoman Sylvina Brooks Powers. I urge you, the committees and my colleagues in the council to not just listen to, but to hear the survivors and advocates who have come forward to testify this morning and to join us in proud and unwavering support of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rivera. Councilman Powers, she remarks. Good morning, um, good morning, everyone. It is good to be here um, to be a part of today's hearing. Thank you to both Chairs Diaz and Levin for the opportunity to speak in favor of intro 2372, which I have introduced with council member Rivera. Our bill will create a two year look back window for gender motivated violence act so that cases where the statute of limitations has expired can be reopened. Victims of gender-based violence face enormous pressure to stay silent in the wake of their abuse. They are trivialized and dismissed. They risk professional setbacks or even further threats of violence for speaking out against their abusers. Without support from others, they can feel totally alone while it is heartbreaking, it is not at all surprising that many survivors stay silent. The reality is it can take months or years before a survivor feels safe enough to share their story. Our legal system must recognize this reality. All survivors deserve to have their voice heard on their terms, but far too often they are stonewalled by an expired statute of limitations with this new two year look back window, countless others will finally be able to come forward. Justice delayed is justice denied. And when we pass this bill, justice will be delivered. I'm looking forward to hearing input from my colleagues and advocates on our bill. I urge my colleagues to join us in delivering justice to all New Yorkers and working to finally bring an end to gender-based violence. And once again, thank you so much to my colleague, Council Member Rivera for um, partnering up on this critical piece of legislation. Um, and to my colleagues in government, we have work to be done and this bill is a step in the right direction. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Councilman Brooks Powers. I'm not sure if Councilman Kalos is on, if he's on and would like to bring commentary on this bill. No, okay. Again, that, thank you for the presentation of this bill. Someone that has been a, a DV victim can definitely relate to having an opportunity to think back and, and work through issues. You know, um, as, a, as a victim, you often need the time to accept internalize and step forward. So again, th thank you for introducing the, this conversation and I look in, in greater support to this bill. I'm now gonna turn it over to the moderator, Ms. Chloe Rivera. 
Thank you, Chairs Diaz and Levin. My name is Chloe Rivera, and I serve as a Senior Policy Analyst the Committee on Women, Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Um, just as an aside, I'd like to acknowledge that Council Member Kalos uh, was in attendance. So before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few second delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock to give you the go ahead and you can begin your testimony. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the New York City Human Resources Administration, the Department of Social Services, and the Mayoral Office and Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. For the administration, we will have Natasha Godby, Deputy Commissioner at HRA, Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Social Services, and Elizabeth Dank from NGBV. I will now administer the oath to the administration. Please raise your right hand. When you, hear my when you hear your name, respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Deputy Commissioner Godby? I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater? Is Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater logged in today? She's here. I do. <laughs> Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Dink. I do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Godby, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank the Committees on General Welfare and Women and Gender Equity for holding today's hearing and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Natasha Godby and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Emergency and Intervention Services, EIS, for the Human Resources Administration, HRA. I am joined by Elizabeth Dank from the New York City Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, and GBV. <laughs> Today, we look forward to updating the council on our work to address domestic violence across the city and our efforts to bring support and services to the most vulnerable New Yorkers. In the previous testimony before the council in 2019, an update was provided on this topic. And a few short months later, COVID-19 changed our environment and way of delivering services. While the pandemic brought on many challenges, we look forward to updating the council on the critical work that continued uninterrupted by our staff and providers to ensure service continuity and support for survivors of domestic violence. HRA is the nation's largest social services agency, assisting over 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of public assistance programs, including cash assistance, employment programs, food stamps, public health insurance, and other supports that help New Yorkers remain in the workforce. HRA also plays a role in the administration of housing programs such as supportive housing and services designed to assist individuals who are experiencing chronic homelessness, individuals with HIV AIDS, individuals with serious mental illness and or individuals who are survivors of domestic violence amongst others. Much of our work focuses on advancing one of this administration's chief priorities, reducing income inequality and leveling the playing field for all New Yorkers. Our staff at HRA's Office of Domestic Violence works each day to address the life-altering effects of domestic violence, a significant driver of poverty and homelessness. This is achieved by ensuring that survivors and their families have access to safe living conditions and trauma-informed services, 
both within the shelter systems and as they transition back into their communities. HRA works with providers across the city to connect survivors of domestic violence and their children to critical services and programs. This work follows the New York State Domestic Violence Prevention Act of 1987, which requires counties to provide both non-residential services and residential, residential shelter services to survivors of domestic violence and establishes program funding. The New York State Office of Children and Family Services, OCFS, promulgates and maintains regulations for licensure, and the standards for the establishment and maintenance of residential and non-residential domestic violence programs. OCFS authorizes DSS HRA's administration of the financial and contractual requirements of domestic violence emergency residential shelter programs. Additionally, the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, OTDA, authorizes DSS HRA to administer the financial and contractual requirements of the domestic violence tier two residential shelter system. HRA's domestic violence shelter system is the largest in the nation. Our programs are designed to stabilize clients in a safe environment and are developed to address the trauma of domestic violence while at the same time increasing a client's self-sufficiency. The robust suite of services includes, but is not limited to, individual counseling, advocacy, psychoeducational groups, and trauma-focused interventions. All domestic violence shelters are required to provide childcare services and assist clients with obtaining permanent housing, benefit entitle, entitlement application assistance, financial development services, and workforce readiness services to enhance clients' self-sufficiency. Our emergency domestic violence shelter system consists of 55 confidential facilities across the city with a total bed capacity of 2,451 emergency beds. These emergency shelter providers offer trauma-informed services to survivors of domestic violence who are in imminent risk and or are fleeing a current domestic violence incident. Within the 55 sites, there are 10 DV tier two transitional shelter facilities. They include 447 units that serve domestic violence survivors who have stabilized over time in the emergency system and require extended services. In calendar year 2020, HRA DV shelters served a total of 9,439 adults and children, of which 2,341 were families with children and 386 were single adults that were discharged from domestic violence emergency shelters. These figures should be seen within the context of this administration's ongoing efforts to increase support for survivors of domestic violence. Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Banks increased shelter capacity. Under their tenure, 300 additional emergency beds were added and are operational and 400 tier two units were awarded of which 233 are operational. 62 tier two units are scheduled to open at the end of this calendar year and 105 tier two units are scheduled to open in fiscal year 23. The last group of tier two units were originally scheduled to open in calendar year 2021. However, they are delayed because of construction and operational related delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since 2015, emergency shelters have served approximately 25,000 individuals per year. During that same timeline, tier two shelters have served between 7,000 and 10,000 individuals per year. Looking at occupancy, since 2015, emergency shelter occupancy increased by over 160% and by over 300% for tier two shelters. There are various entry points into the HRA domestic violence residential shelter system. First, through the New York City Domestic Violence Hotline managed by Safe Horizon. 
where domestic violence survivors can connect with advocates to receive services, counseling, and information about available resources to maintain their, their and their families' safety. HRA NOVA, or No Violence Again, operates out of DHS intake centers where trained social workers conduct intake for domestic violence shelter placement, offer crisis counseling and referrals for services. Lastly, community-based referrals are other shelter entry points for survivors. OCFS regulations permit one third of shelter populations to be referred from the community, such as local police stations and neighborhood hospitals. Enhanced domestic violence services. Now I would like to take an opportunity to shift and provide an update on our programs serving survivors of domestic violence. Our emergency shelter services are available and designed to assist domestic violence survivors who are facing imminent dangers to their safety and in need of safe temporary housing in accordance with state law. Our programs aim to help our clients manage the trauma of domestic violence and enhance their self-sufficiency. Specific services include one-on-one -on -one counseling, client advocacy, psychoeducational and trauma-informed interventions to address a client's individual domestic violence experience. Moreover, our shelter programs include housing and benefit assistance, financial development services, economic empowerment programs, mental health and substance use counseling, and may include child care services provided on site or via partnerships. Our efforts to improve our services for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault continue with the implementation of this year's Local Law 102, which requires DSS to provide survivor-centered responses to complaints of sexual assault or harassment made by a client or staff. We are working towards implementing the requirements of this local law and are coordinating the training and outreach steps to ensure survivors are aware of available resources all domestic violence contracted providers were contacted and notified of their responsibility for developing and providing to HRA their policy and procedures to address sexual harassment as per executive order number 64 of March 2021. HRA in conjunction with NGBV developed a flyer with information and links to resources to assist survivors of sexual violence and provided the flyer to all domestic violence contracted providers to post and distribute in domestic violence shelters and non-residential contractor locations. We are working in conjunction with NGBV on the development of training and linkages and access to resources. We appreciate the council's work and suggestions as we serve our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Gender equity. We also would like to update the committees on our gender equity work. Over time, programs for domestic violence survivors were originally created to serve cis women and their children. The DSS Diversity and Equity Team's Gender Equity Initiative engaged HRA's non-residential domestic violence providers regarding ensuring that they are inclusive places for people of all genders. Currently, HRA is working in collaboration with the Director of Equity and Gender to develop training to address services for LGBTQI plus individuals. The New York State Social Services Law mandates HRA to provide emergency shelter and other services for survivors of domestic violence. The law does not make distinctions on the basis of sex or gender identity, and HRA requires that all services are provided to all New Yorkers, regardless of their sex or gender identity. A domestic violence survivor is any person over the age of 16, any married person or any parent accompanied by his or her minor child or children in situations in which such person or such person's child is a victim who experiences domestic violence. Placements in domestic violence shelter are subject to the client's designated safe area, family composition, availability of a bed or unit that can accommodate the client's criteria, and any other special needs that the client may have, including but not limited to their specific medical needs, pets, employment, and child's school location. In calendar year 2020, 
The population of clients served that were over the age of 18, including single and heads of household, comprised of 143 clients who reported they identified as male and 2,925 who reported they identified as female. To date, in calendar year 2021, 116 clients reported they identified as male and 2,744 reported they identified as female. Rental assistance access. Our Office of Domestic Violence Housing Support Services works with domestic violence shelter clients who are eligible for HRA housing subsidies, helping to issue housing certifications, reviewing and approving housing application packages and conducting lease signings and renewals. As part of our efforts to enhance safety measures for our clients, clients have the ability to self-determine safe areas in communities where they are seeking permanent housing. This meticulous process helps ease limitations and expands housing options for domestic violence survivors seeking a safe home. Aftercare and wraparound services. Our programs and services also support domestic violence survivors to transition back into their communities. These services include crisis intervention, case management and advocacy, counseling, support groups, and economic security advocacy and are delivered through the New York City Family Justice Centers, FJC, and community-based services. HRA works with nine contracted providers to offer state-mandated non-residential services across the city for survivors. This program offers a range of supportive services to families who are survivors of domestic violence, along with aftercare services for clients transitioning out of shelter to ensure they are stabilized once they relocate to permanent housing. In fiscal year 2021, the non-residential service providers enrolled 21,538 clients. Domestic Violence Legal Services. HRA's Office of Civil Justice, OCJ, which manages and monitors the city's programs that provide civil legal assistance to New Yorkers in need, operates critical legal services programs that specifically address the legal needs of survivors of domestic and intimate partner violence. The service for survivors facing housing legal issues such as possible eviction, harassment by an unscrupulous landlord or other threats to the stability of their homes, OCJ and its nonprofit legal service providers partners have made housing legal assistance available to, to survivors in all of the city's family justice centers. This program has provided legal assistance to 210 survivors and other household members through the referrals made at FJCs. HRA also prioritizes immigration legal support services for survivors and their families. In fiscal year 2021, the city's immigration legal support services, which include Action New York City, the Immigration Opportunity Initiatives, IOI, and legal programs supported by federal community service block grants have assisted survivors in 878 immigration legal matters. OCJ also manages legal service programs through the Supporting Alternatives to Violent Encounters or SAVE program, which is funded by the council. The SAVE program provides free legal services to domestic violence and intimate partner violence survivors in areas including family, matrimonial and consumer law. Exits from DV Shelter. In 2018, local law number 83 was enacted amending section 21-141 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to exits from domestic violence emergency shelters. Local law 83 requires HRA to submit an annual report to the Speaker of the New York City Council and upload to the Council's website exits from domestic violence emergency shelters. In accordance with OCFS regulations, emergency domestic violence shelters provide temporary safe housing and supportive services for up to 90 days and with an additional extension up to a maximum of 180 days for clients in need of extended emergency services. 
Providers are expected to develop a housing plan with domestic violence shelter clients, while the HRA Office of Domestic Violence ODV works closely with providers to support staff and clients during each transition. In calendar year 2020, HRA DV shelters served a total of 9,439 adults and chil children, of which 2,341 were families with children and 386 were single adults that were discharged from domestic violence emergency shelters. Streamlining client transition. HRA and DHS have, implement, have implemented a streamlined process for clients who have reached the state set 90 day limit in the domestic violence emergency system with no available options for permanent housing to seamlessly transfer into the DHS shelter system. This process promotes a safer and more efficient path for DV clients to access DHS resources and eliminates the disruptions that can occur when families move from one system to another and simplifies the sharing of information for admissions purposes. HRA's Office of Domestic Violence works closely with providers who are expected to assist clients in developing a transition or exit strategy to support staff and clients during each individual transition. In 2020, three single, in 2020, three single adults and 446 families timing out of DV shelters under the state rule transitioned over to DHS shelters. Human trafficking liaison. As part of the responsibilities under the New York State Anti-Trafficking Statute, HRA is mandated to establish a human trafficking victim liaison. HRA's HTV liaison is responsible for monitoring the application process of all state confirmed human trafficking victims, including minor victims who have been referred to HRA by OTDA contracted providers to apply for cash assistance, Medicaid and SNAP benefits. New York State assigns a contracted social service provider to assist the client with such services. HRA has seen an increase in the number of referrals. In 2020, 18 referrals were received, and of that number, 13 applied for and received benefits. In 2021, to date, HRA has received 60 HTV referrals, and thus far, 17 clients applied for and received benefits. Our office continues to monitor the application process for the remaining referred clients. HTVs are able, HTVs are able to seek shelter either from DHS or the DV shelter system if they are homeless. As an example, in 2021, seven clients had a prior history of visiting a DHS homeless intake site and were assessed by the No Violence Again program. Additionally, four had a prior stay in DV, in, I'm sorry, in domestic violence shelter. HRA domestic violence programs and services. HRA's Office of Domestic Violence provides several programs and services to survivors of domestic violence and their children, including temporary housing, emergency shelter and supportive services, and trauma-informed programming. These programs include No Violence Again, NOVA. As mentioned earlier in the testimony, one point of, in, one point of entry into domestic violence shelter is through the NOVA program. No Violence Again or NOVA assists DV survivors seeking emergency housing from DHS. When a family member discloses that they have experienced domestic violence during the DHS intake process, or DHS staff believes that DV may be an issue for a family, the family is referred to NOVA for domestic violence safety assessment and possible placement in a HRA DV shelter. In calendar year 2020, 5,274 clients were assessed, of which 908 were determined to be eligible for placement under the state standard. Domestic Violence Liaison Unit. In accordance with OTDA public assistance regulations, the Domestic Violence Liaison Unit works to protect survivors of domestic violence who are at risk of being endangered through compliance with federal and state public assistance requirements particularly those related to employment and child support. Clients are served by liaisons at all HRA FIA job centers. 
who helped determine eligibility for waivers from employment, child support, and other requirements to meet the client's safety and confidentiality needs. These waivers help survivors avoid activities that may put their safety at risk, such as traveling to an employment location where the abuser could find them and or participating in paternity and child support enforcement court proceedings. The waivers give the clients the opportunity to safely comply with federal and state public assistance requirements so they can continue to safely seek employment and receive child support. In calendar year 2020, the Domestic Violence Liaison Unit assessed 6,920 clients for safety and 5,694 waivers were granted under federal and state rules. Anti-Domestic Violence Eligibility Needs Team, ADVENT. <clears throat> the Anti-Domestic Violence Eligibility Needs Team, or ADVENT, conducts routine eligibility determinations and individualized case management for domestic violence survivors. The ADVENT team also processes housing applications and lease documents for HRA housing programs for clients in domestic violence shelters. In fiscal year 2020, ADVENT provided specialized services to an average of 311 clients in receipt of domestic violence services per month. The Alternative to Shelter Program, ATS. The Alternative to Shelter, or ATS, which is transitioning to NGBV, is a program that helps reduce the need to enter shelter by giving domestic violence survivors who have orders of protection the option to remain safely in their homes. ATS assesses each client's need and develops a safety plan with the NYPD's coordination to ensure that the client and their family can quickly alert the authorities when in danger. Clients are provided with a personal electronic response alarm device that is connected to a system that is monitored 24 hours a day that notifies authorities to dispatch police when the alarm is activated. In calendar year 2020, ATS received 747 new referrals and had an average active caseload of 192 clients per month. Teen Relationship Abuse Prevention Program, RAP. The Teen Relationship Abuse Program, Prevention Program, RAP, is a nationally recognized domestic violence primary prevention program. Located in public high schools and middle schools citywide, the program provides a comprehensive curriculum in which students learn to recognize and change destructive patterns of behavior before they are transferred to adult relationships. On average, 420 students a month receive individual or group counseling with an on average 330 completing the three session curriculum. DV Mental Health Services. HRA in collaboration with NGBV will now have funding to establish a mobile and on-demand mental health services program that will provide shelter-wide mental health support services to domestic violence clients and their children. The program will commence in early 2022 and further enhance the current array of domestic violence services provided by existing contracted providers by incorporating approximately 30 licensed clinicians, psychiatrists, and social workers that will immediately screen, assess, and provide mental health-focused care to approximately 9,500 families entering DV residential services programs throughout the year. The mobile and on-demand mental health services will include a multi-tiered approach to provision of mental health services to domestic violence survivors and their families residing in DV shelter. Mental health trauma-informed social work services that are delivered in a culturally relevant environment and sensitive to the effects of domestic violence. Mental health services with a focus on children duly affected by both vicarious or secondary domestic violence trauma exposure and the adverse effects of homelessness on children a universal mental health screening tool, which can be used for the evaluation of all newly admitted shelter residents, delivery of secondary tier 
mental health non-pharmaceutical intervention via a psychologist, social worker for domestic violence survivors with identified mental health needs. Crisis on call mental health services that can be provided either in person or via telehealth. The third tier of mental health services will be in the form of a warm handoff to New York City Health and Hospital Psychiatric Services via linkages. Responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we would like to highlight some of the essential work that HRA's Office of Domestic Violence staff performed during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue to engage clients and all survivors to ensure the continuity of critical services efficiently and without any disruption as the city transitioned to remote work. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Office of Domestic Violence continuously provided services to domestic violence survivors, including social services and shelter, in addition to new services to meet our different environments, such as internet connectivity for clients. The office continues to provide these critical services and has worked to extend our public reach by breaking down barriers and meeting survivors where they are. For example, in collaboration with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, the office is assessing additional means of communication via the Domestic Violence Hotline for initial assistance, such as text and chat communication functions, which may open other avenues for domestic violence survivors to seek help. During the initial phase of the pandemic from February to April of 2020, the agency saw a decrease in the number of domestic violence referrals from the New York City DB hotline. Since then, the referrals have increased to their pre-pandemic levels. To inform the public that domestic violence services were available during the pandemic, HRA and NGBV ran social media notifications to expand, to expand our outreach to vulnerable communities. Several steps were taken throughout domestic violence shelters to maintain safety during the pandemic. Domestic violence shelters have been following Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, guidance and, pr and protocols around safety to protect the health of our clients and their families. Domestic violence shelter providers have also been provided with free personal protective equipment from city and state agencies, such as hand sanitizer and masks for clients and staff. To safeguard the health and safety of our clients and staff at shelters, clients who tested positive for COVID-19 were quarantined in their individual shelter unit or offered a DHS isolation unit. Additionally, Several initiatives were taken by our agencies in the city to improve our clients' time in shelter. To improve connectivity and remote learning, the city installed Wi-Fi in domestic violence shelters throughout the city beginning in 2020. Additionally, HRA worked closely with New York City Department of Education to ensure all school-aged children at domestic violence shelters receive a device to access the internet. Clients and their families now have unlimited Wi-Fi access for educational purposes, as well as to search for housing, employment, and related services, such as social service benefits using Access HRA. From its onset and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, HRA has advocated for and received significant temporary waivers from state and federal requirements to provide clients greater access to benefits and services. One of these waivers we obtained extended the 180-day state limit on domestic violence and emergency shelter stays, giving our clients the flexibility and time to get back on their feet. As we have reported to the council previously, DSS, HRA, and DHS also put in place several COVID-19 reforms and operational changes to better serve our clients. For example, we waived all in-person engagements for survivors of domestic violence and set up call-in numbers for assessment and crisis counseling. In addition to being protected by the various eviction moratoria put in place due to the pandemic, on an as-needed basis, our clients were connected to pandemic resources such as New York State Emergency Rental Assistance Program, ERAP. 
resources such as these can assist our clients and their families to transition from shelter and ultimately return safely to the community. Legislation. Intro 2732 recognizes the complexities of gender-based violence that may contribute to a delayed initiation of a civil legal remedy. We support the intent of this legislation to expand and strengthen access to resources and remedies for survivors, and we look forward to working with the council on a final bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on our work to protect survivors of domestic violence. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Deputy Gobai, very extensive report. I'm sure after this hearing, staff and I are going to review, 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 because quite frankly, after hearing so much is, is being done on paper, I, you know, one would hope that our numbers would decrease through our time as opposed to increase. So, but again, thank you for your extensive report. Thank you. Yeah. I, I like to acknowledge some of my colleagues that have, that have joined. Majority Leader Com Combo's here. Council, uh, Councilwoman Gib Vanessa Gibson, Council Member Genoa, who else? Tenaro, um, Council Member Lander, if I have not acknowledged him earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Diaz. I believe the other members of the administration are available for Q and A. So you may begin um, with Chair Levin with questions. Chair Diaz, do you have any questions for the administration? I definitely do. I just need a couple of seconds to gather. I was taking notes as as a deputy was in conversation. Like, okay, but we'll, we'll we'll get back on target. Again, thank you, thank you so much for answering some of my questions. You know, in reference to statistics and the impact, and 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 thank you for thinking outside the box and extending the stay of 180 days um, to better serve the families um, under under your wing, if if I may say that. Okay. I do remember hearing that we, there was an expectation of meeting a, a greater ability for capacity by the end of this year, 2021, um, and perhaps you, you've fallen short. Do we have a remedy for um, that? I guess we're working with the providers. Uh, they are working through the process of giving their licensure. So for tier twos, the OTDA state oversight has to provide the operating certificate. So there are items that the uh, providers would have to provide to OTDA in order to get final licensure. So uh, the contracts and everything have been completed. Uh, most of the uh, walkthroughs have been done. So at this point, it's really uh, at the state level. Okay, so in the world of that we're living in today, I suspect we're not gonna be able to meet the numbers by 20, by December 31st. Do we have a B plan or a C plan to be able to house individuals if needed? Right. So that I'm, I'm actually going toward the conversation about um, hotels as have they've been used um, in the recent past times to just temporarily house individuals. While I know the system is trying to get, get away from um, using hotels are we thinking further outside and how, how we're going to be able to transition? Uh, currently, we have 62 uh, units that are coming on before the end of the year, and we also have capacity. So we're not seeing um, a lack of uh, space right now for our DV clients. So although we have the 105 coming on in 2022, currently we do have capacity to accommodate our families. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Councilman Malevin, are you back on? Do you see, um, when I work in when I work in the shelter system, I, I found it somewhat um, troubling seeing with many of troublesome with many of my clients that went from being in a DV shelter into a tier two. I I found that with with more time under DV um, setup, they would benefit. While you've had we've been dealing with the pandemic and you've had to extend the stay to 180 um, day past 180. Do you find that it's a benefit? In, in assisting the families and ensuring permanent housing? Yes, yes, we do believe that um, the extended stay does offer people more opportunities to get additional services. And of course, for permanent housing, because the opportunities to find permanent housing do take time. Uh, we work closely with our clients in emergency to transition them to the available tier twos that we have. Okay. Uh, and, and in reference to also clients coming in that fall in, under DV status, do we have a percentage of, of clients that say, yes, I fall under DV, NOVA, um, I'd rather be in a non-DV shelter setting, but still receive services? Uh, yes. Um, if someone is assessed, let's say, um, by NOVA at the DHS site and they refuse a DV uh, placement, for whatever reason, uh, they are offered the additional uh, non-residential services that are provided. And um, the Office of Domestic Violence does work with DHS closely to provide all the information about the non-res providers, as well as those services offered through the FJCs. Do we, is, do we know why, or can you indicate reasons as to why a person would want one over the other? Uh, it, it's what? a... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what services are provided for a family affected by ZV as opposed to someone not affected by ZV. What, service, what services are, are given to one population as opposed to the other? In the realm of uh, domestic violence, there, yes. are, there are social workers that uh, deal directly with the trauma of domestic violence. They counsel them. Um, just because someone, let's say, decides not to go into DV placement, mm -hmm. um, they may still need the services, but they just get them from a community-based provider. Um, we also, the other, uh, the other uh, opportunity there too is that they can get the additional supports from the DHS social workers as well. But if they need the, the additional support for DV, that is provided through the uh, non-res providers. Thank you. I like to have conversation in reference to uh, shelters to the cost. And um, I would say maybe eight months ago, had a conversation in reference to shelter costs and that it's more expensive to keep a family in a DV shelter receiving services as a non-DV shelter. Is, is, that, is that so? I would have to defer to the finance team. Um, I don't really understand um, like the difference in the cost per se, because I know the funding streams are different and the reimbursement is also different depending on the type of shelter. So I, could, I can't really speak to that, but we can follow up. Okay, thank you. Do, um, do we know what the average cost is? Maybe this is a, a question for W Drinkwater to chime in on and, and it's a financial question, but I'd like to maybe have a comparison on what it costs us to shelter a family in DV as opposed to what it would cost us for a family in, in, not, in a non-DV situation. Erin, um, do you have any additional context? Yes, sorry, I was trying to make sure I was unmuted here. Um, in the mayor's management uh, report, uh, for Department of Homeless Services, we do list um, the per diem for uh, our shelters for adults, uh, excuse me, for adult families and single adults. I'm just trying to pull that number up. Um, so the uh, cost per day for single adults in the DHS shelter system 
is $137.74 uh, for families it is $191.36 and for adult families it is $172.99 and that's um, inclusive of shelter and all the associated services and then Natasha if you just want to speak to um, the state per diem for the domestic violence system. Sure. So the, the state per diem for DV shelter varies. Uh, they set the per diem rate every year. Uh, it could go anywhere from $140 to $203 uh, per, you know, per day. Uh, the, the OCFS regulations uh, require that the per diem rate, rate is set on an annual basis. Uh, o, OCFS does review budgets from the providers to determine what the appropriate rate would be for that particular shelter. Uh, the OTDA tier two uh, shelters also follow the same per diem rate, but it varies depending on the size of the shelter, uh, the number of beds or the number of units in the uh, OTDA context. So there's not one particular number. I don't have the average for all DV shelter that I'd have to go back to finance on. That's okay. Th thank you. I'd like to go back. You mentioned the program SAFE of SAFE. My understanding is it, it targets youth. Uh, the the team the team rap yes yes can you remind me of the number you indicated that signed up or if referrals were made okay and what I, what I'm trying to it, it's to me it's not so much as, as numbers but a child is a youth is identified being in a DV situation boyfriend girlfriend. Uh, I, my curiosity is how long do we follow that child, right? So we're, we're in 10th grade, we, we see indicators there. Is it something where the school system is supportive, the counselors are supportive in knowing that this child has had a bad, a negative experience? Do we do, we do the follow-up? I see. Um, can I refer to Elizabeth Dank? <laughs> Hi, Liz, can you give us some more context if we know? Sure. Hi. Um, sure. So just general overview of um, RAP and early RAP. So um, the RAP program um, is a program run by HRA that is in um, high schools and some middle schools across the city. Um, and a few years ago, we expanded the RAP program um, to include early RAP which was expanding uh, youth prevention education programming and services into middle schools across DOE schools in the city as well. Um, so through um, those programs and community-based providers, students um, are connected to uh, workshops about healthy relationships and support is also provided to both students and families who are experiencing domestic and gender-based violence. Um, earlier this year, MDV also um, launched the ABCs of Healthy Relationships, which is a new curriculum that we developed through a public-private partnership in collaboration with the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City and the Chosen Foundation and Day One um, to create toolkits for parents, educators, um, and caregivers to provide healthy relationship education to students in grades K through five. So it's the first time the city had um, implemented curriculum support for students in elementary schools. It, with, within um, the next 15 days, can you please share with me what the cool, tip, what the cool um, kit looks like? I'd also like to make sure that our counterparts in, in the Department of Education are paying attention to the, cool, uh, the toolkit, especially since we've had the trans transitioning from working from home to in person and knowing that each school in the near future is gonna have additional support of mental health services staff. I think it's really important that we're all brought up to date on the resources that, that are made available. Sure, Thank we you. can definitely send that. Um, and also just noting that the toolkit is available on NTDB's website and it's also available through DOE's parent university. And we're working closely with DOE to continue to identify ways to push out the toolkit to families. Okay, so I know that I send emails out in a massive amount and not every email is opened or, or replied to. Do you have a, a mechanism in place for checks, checks and balances? That you know you send it to PS108 in East New York 
and the email was opened? Is there a receipt? How, how do you know that anyone that you send the kit to and you've tried to engage has actually uh, at least acknowledged receiving the information that you're sending over? Mm -hmm. So um, I can get back to you on ways that we're tracking utilization of the toolkits. Um, I would imagine that um, the key metric we will be utilizing, and this was just launched a few weeks ago, but I imagine the key metric we'll be utilizing are um, hits to the toolkit on our website, but we can get back to you to talk more about the utilization um, tracking that we'll be doing. Wonderful. If I learned anything from Department of Homeless Services, it's getting a receipt. You know, so this, this way, you know, it's, it's, it's actually happening. It may be annoying to staff who have to sign off and check the balances, but it's a way of us actually proving that services are, are being provided, or at least we're attempting to um, be good government. I, I'm going to um, stop my, my questioning. I see Councilwoman Rivera has her hand up. I'm not sure if she wants to jump in now. Time starts now. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Diaz, Chair Diaz. I just have a couple of quick questions for the administration. Uh, I did hear that the administration does support intro 2372, is that correct? Yes. Great, so intro, intro 2372A includes changes that shift language from the individual to party or parties. How does the administration anticipate the impact of this change to the Gender Motivated Violence Act? So I'll uh, defer to Elizabeth Day, my colleague. Liz? I was just working on everything. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Sure thing. Sorry about the background noise. So um, in the amendment to 2372, it would include changes that uh, shift language from the individual to party or parties. And do you anticipate the impact uh, of this change to the GMBA? Um. So I think we're eager to um, speak with you further and follow up to discuss um, a final version of this bill. Um, we are definitely in support of the intent to expand resources and remedies for survivors and look forward to discussing further with you. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that. And, and of course, I'm, I'm thankful for, for your support and us and assisting us to get this done before the end of the term, especially, I think it's urgent. Does the administration have data that indicates how many New Yorkers the GMBA in its current form has impacted since its passing in 2000? I don't have um, access to that data. I think we'd have to, um, unless the HRA has anything to add, I think we'd have to follow up to see what data we have to provide around that. Okay. So um, does anyone on the panel have any of this data uh, 20 years in the making? No, not, not, not at this time, not from HRA. Okay, if you can uh, get back to us with, with, with that information, we would be um, grateful. Um, and I would just say that I just think it's critical to expand these prote protections beyond the individual. So I'm looking forward to working with you all to make sure that we can, of course, strengthen the bill and have it passed and implemented as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Chair Diaz, for the time and to the administration for their testimony and their work on this. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Councilman Rivera, for thinking outside the box. I'm not sure, Chair Levin. Are you, are you back? I'm sorry, Chloe, I'm doing your job. I'll, I'll step back. <laughs> I see. No, no, no problem. Uh, if any other council members have questions at this time, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call you in the order of hands raised. And also I'd like to ask the administration to remain unmuted when you are in Q&A. Thank you. 
And if I might, I'd like to share that for those of us at the other end, those of you that are speaking through the mass, sometimes it, it comes across muffled to us. So perhaps at a lower pace, and I'm not sure what your confines are, but the, what I am receiving on my side via text is that it's difficult to hear, which may also make it difficult um, in reading in for those that are, that are chiming in. Chloe, back to you. Just waiting on direction, waiting for any council members with questions at the moment. If you could just give me a few more moments. Seeing no other council member hands raised at this time, uh, Chair Diaz, would you like to move to public testimony? Absolutely. Great. I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Chair, I, I just had to step aside for a second. I'm, 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 I'm back here. It's okay. I, I know we're, we're juggling many hearings at the same time. Your pardon. Jump right in. Give, give him a hard time. Let's go. Give me one moment. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask um, a few questions just about um, how the service delivery within the um, the um, uh, HRA system for domestic violence shelters is um, is being um, currently delivered. Um, at the current moment, um, uh, is there's, there's been an increase in capacity in, in um, over the last uh, year, is that correct? There's been new capacity that's opened up? Mm. Yes. Um, how, many, how many new um, uh, spots within the system? I give me one moment, please. So in so in July of from July of 2021 to present for our tier twos, uh, we opened uh, 70 additional units. And in May of 2021, we opened 44 additional units. Let's see. And we are on track to have 400 in total by 2021, I'm sorry, by 2022. And all 300 additional emergency beds have already been awarded and are operational. Um, and how many, um, and I apologize if, if one of my colleagues had asked this already, um, how many um, <clears throat> clients uh, uh, um, go from the uh, HRA DV system into the DHS system. Are those that are streamlined? Well, just that are that that uh, will actually end up not being uh, placed into permanent housing directly from the HRA system, but they'll actually end up going into the the DHS system. DHS system. 
I can look at uh, the the exit reports that we had provided under the local law. It does show uh, how many clients uh, left DV shelter and went into DHS shelter. Uh, looking at the uh, numbers from 2020. Uh, we had 449 households go from DV shelter into DHS. Out of how many, out of how many um, exits in total? Uh, the total exits for uh, 2020, the number of households was uh, 2,727. So, uh, so about, um, about one out of five or so uh, exits are exiting into the DHS system? Not that great with, <laughs> with math, so <laughs> I'll take your word for it. But based on our um, 2020 report uh, at page three, that's the local law report we provide to the council. It showed that um, 1,007 people, meaning, uh, adults and children, which is 449 households went from DV shelter into DHS. Um, I mean, obviously that's, um, that's a major source of concern. And, and, and uh, I mean, there should be no family that or um, individual that, that has to um, go to the, the um, DHS system. Um, I mean, it, it, and can you speak a little bit about um, the difference in the service delivery? Um, um, what 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 is a family not getting at uh, the in the DHS system that they are getting within the within the um, the HRA DV system? Good question. I want to hear because I think I know the answer. Well, the, the DV families uh, continue to get DV support. Uh, the DHS social workers do um, provide, you know, information about permanent housing, employment, child care services. All those things are still offered in the DHS system. The only additional overlay for DV um, clients is that they still have access to the Office of Domestic Violence at their PA clients. Our admin teams and ODV staff still assist them with permanent housing options as well. Uh, so far as the uh, trauma-informed social services, the counseling, they're still getting that. They still have um, connections to non-residential DV support. Um, so the, the clients are still supported once they leave DV shelter. Um, I mean, obviously that's, you know, the, not every, um, not every DHS, um, funded and run shelter has the level of services, whether you, whether it's trauma informed care or um, um, you know the, the the array of social services that are available. I mean, it's just it's not obviously with within the the contracts that um, uh, that are funded um, in terms of staff. It, it um, I think that it's it, it it continues to represent you know like a, a, a I think a um, a shortcoming of the system if uh, any family is is being discharged from the HRA system into into the DHS system um, regardless of of, of whether um, you know we're attempting to uh, provide the same level of service. I don't think that it's, it's uh, uh, necessarily comparable. Um, in, in terms of um, uh, exits uh, with, um, through rental assistance, is there, what's the, re, what's the report show on um, exits from the uh, HRA system, the HRA DV system into permanent housing th with rental assistance vouchers? See. I don't have all of the numbers in front of me, but we can share the um, the local law eighty three report. It does show the the number of um, housing subsidies that were um, that were used 
by DB clients. So we can recirculate that. I don't have the numbers offhand. We don't have it in front of us. We're trying to pull it up now. Okay. Natasha, I just pulled it up. Uh, Council member, I'm happy to, to update on the exits. Can you hear me? Yes, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, just give me one second to adjust here. Sorry about that. Um, so you are particularly interested in um, exits with a rental exits subsidy based on. Uh, got it. Um, so we had. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure we're, we're sending the right information. Um, so of those um, that were exited to uh, housing, we had um, 14 households who exited uh, to NYCHA. Um, we had 64 households who exited uh, with a rental subsidy, 91 with no rental subsidy, three with supportive housing, uh, 414 made their own arrangements, um, and 762 uh, is unknown. So, um, so less than 70 exited with a rental subsidy. Yes, this is over calendar year 2020. Um, so those numbers, uh, I don't have the numbers from 2019 in front of me, um, mm -hmm. but there was certainly- Calendar year 2020. Uh, um, implication because of the pandemic. Sure. Um, do we know, um, I mean, is, is, is every client, um, do we know how many had access to a, a like a city FEP shopping letter? In other words, did, it, it, somebody's spending six months in, in, in an HRA shelter, they should have. Um, we can um, get back to that, that time. number. I mean, but they, that obviously they should, if they're qualifying, um, if they meet the qualifications on, on um, income requirements, they should be, they should have access to. Um, you know, we can get back to, to you with that number. Okay. Right. We don't have the numbers, but yes, the clients are um, issued a shopping letter on day one, actually. Yes. As soon as their information is entered into our, um, in our dat database, we search to see if they're known to HRA. And if we have all of their income information, they get a shopping letter immediately. But they're, but they're eight times as likely to exit into the, into the, the DHS system as they are to exit into um, permanent housing with with a uh, with a rental subsidy you know if there's only about 60 or 70 um, exited with a rental subsidy um, and 400 exited into um, the DHS system I mean that's not really that's not an, that's not yeah, a, I, an acceptable I, outcome no and those numbers I mean Can't hear you, Aaron. He's thinking. Oh. <laughs> Aaron, were you saying something? Hi, are folks everybody hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm having a warning saying that my microphone's disconnected all of a sudden. Um, I'm not sure where I cut off, but just to, to say that, you know, in the course of calendar year 2020, there was a period of time where um, apartment viewings weren't happening. We needed to shift to the virtual apartment viewings. Um, mm -hmm. So just using it as a representative, uh, it was right. certainly representative of 2020. Um, but just want to point that out as well. Sure, sure. So 2020 was not necessarily a representative year. Um, um, and we don't have data at all for 2021 yet. Correct. The next report is due, I believe, in April to the, to the council. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, if, that, if, if it is any indication, obviously, it's very frustrating um, to hear um, you know, just considering the amount of time that this council and effort this council has put into trying to make rental subsidies um, a priority. And um, I mean, I, you know, I can tell you personally, I've, I've worked on the issue of rental subsidies for 12 years now um, at the council and as chair for almost eight years now. Um, of trying to prioritize um, making rental subsidies a viable option. Um, and, um, you know, and to see that somebody really generally, I mean, at least in the calendar year of 2020, um, <clears throat> was eight times more likely to exit the DV system into the DHS system than to exit the DV system into a permanent subsidized apartment, um, at least through a, through a city FAPS voucher. It's very, very frustrating. Um, and um, uh, just indicates to me that there was, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm leaving this job in, in a month and um, demonstrates to me that it's, you know, there's been, a, you know, a, a, a real failure on, on my part um, that, you know, after eight years, there is still there's still this, this <clears throat> lack of stability for people um, who are going through this period in their lives and um, in, in these, these trials in their lives. And um, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. We don't have apartments lined up for people the second that they walk in the door. Um, but um, it's not, it's not an acceptable outcome if that is an, an, an acceptable situation, if that, is, that disparity is that great. And I hope that, um, you know, that, that that will change with the increase in the voucher amounts um, and, uh, and maybe make them more um, functional, but, um, you know, that's an indication because when somebody got, when, I mean, when a family goes into the DHS system, um, I mean, it is, you know, the average length of stay within the DHS system is for families like, you know, it's over 400, 400 and some odd days or 500 days. Um, and I just, I don't, I mean, I, do, I don't know how, I, I feel like if a family is going from the DV system into the DHS system, they start over on day one when they go into the D, DHS system, like in terms of their, their ability to kind of get into long-term stable housing. Like it's not a, it's not like a, I, I, I don't know how there could be continuity. You have a new provider, you have a new case manager, you're going to have new, housing specialist, you have other people who are further along, you know, within 
the process to have been at that shelter longer. So you're not going to be like first in line to get permanent housing. And I, I just, it's, it's, I, I just, I think that we have to do better as a city. Steve, if, if I may, mm -hmm. the only way they were able to get a family that's been packaged, let's say for night shift, because I'm looking at the numbers, 14 families exited. Typically, when a family exits a DV shelter, you would think that their application is still alive, is active. But as you pointed out, once they get into the next DV setting, if the worker that they're working into does not have the follow-up, does not know that the person was linked to a unit, it's as if it, it never happened. That's why our numbers are also low, right? So you're, pat, you're, you're, you're in the DV shelter, it's four months, you, you went into DV, you qualified for a NYCHA unit because you, if I'm correct, you have to have two arrests in order to qualify to go into, into New York City Housing Authority pool. So you in the four months, you have, you have your two reports, you, you, you have the arrest. Now you go into a, a shelter provider that does not have staff that's aware of how to find out if, there's a night of a, if you've been linked. And that's how I see often our families fall through the cracks. Where A is not communicating with B accurately. And that's a problem. As, as Chair Levin stated, eight years, and he's not seeing a significant, significant increase in numbers, that, that's disheartening. But firsthand experience, uh, um, if, you, if you have staffers at that next process that are not following, that are not having a clear conversation, with the client coming in, they're gonna to continue to fall through the cracks. We also, if I can highly recommend, when a family is identified in a DV setting and identified for a unit, that we figure out a way to be compassionate and hold that family there. To me, it makes no sense. I'm in a DV setting for four months. I'm in a tier two now, and I'm advocating and trying to figure out that new, ses that new system to then continue to advocate and fight to get into a NYCHA unit or a set aside. It doesn't make any sense, right? What will likely happen is the family becomes frustrated. That work that was done for four months of DV shelter falls out the window. The person returns back to a harmful, dysfunctional environment. And years later, they may come back into the system. That, that's where I see that our, our, our disconnect is. The continuance of service is, is not, as effective as as um, it should be, Steve. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Sorry. Oh yes, I was just going to say. Um, so, Council Member Diaz, um, if there is a family that is connected or in the process of going through um, an apartment, um, let's say they're about to move or they signed a lease or they're in that process, right? We generally will extend the stay. And sometimes even if it's beyond the 180 day maximum, and at that point, the, the stays over that, that time frame would be charged to city tax levy. So we wouldn't discharge a family if they're in the middle of moving into an apartment or in that phase, because we do understand that we don't want anything to disrupt the, the ability for that family to get that apartment. So oftentimes but, we will extend the stay. Unfortunately, that may be the policy, but it doesn't happen across the board. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving testimony reference to it. What I'm sharing with you is the experience. 13 and a half years working the shelter system a significant amount of families, and then I had to advocate and try to figure out why were you in shelter for so long? What's going on? Then I have to go to DHS to, to get the application expedited and to try to figure out something that if, it, if the families were left in place, then we wouldn't be doing this. So I appreciate the fact that that's supposed to be the policy and you would think it's across the board. No. Not all providers are doing that. So, sorry to have to re, re, no, inform you of it, but uh, it's, it's, it's the reality of what, what families are, are, are going through. I, I do have some more questions, but I see my colleagues, Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Lewis has a question and, and Chairman uh, Councilman Rosenthal, so if it's directed to the DV conversation, please proceed. 
Councilwoman Lewis first and then Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Diaz and Levin for holding this important hearing. And I also wanna commend Councilman Rivera, Books Powers and Rosenthal on their bills. Um, and I just have a quick question for the administration, recognizing the number of DV incidents that increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm sure that we're all aware of them and heard these stories in the press. Um, and with two new shelters slated to open in the city, I wanted to know if the administration is exploring um, options for more DV shelters to be open before the year is over or in early 2022. Um, and if that's the plan, um, how is the administration assessing this plan? For example, is there an interagency strategy that's involved that includes DHS, HRA, NYPD, and other agencies? that provide social services um, needed for these residents? And how is your interagency strategy involving local community members so that they're involved in the process? I think what we witnessed here in District 45 is that a shelter would be opened and because there's lack of social services and support, a lot of these residents fall into prostitution. Um, and into other issues. So I'm just trying to figure out like what's the next step in the strategies if you're gonna be opening more shelters. Thank you. Hi, so the, thank you. The shelters that are uh, slated for 2022 were already part of the expansion in the emergency declaration from 2015. Uh, so far as additional shelters opening before the end of the year, we only have the one tier two with the 62 units This um, that was scheduled and planned and should open uh, by the end of the year. Um, any new uh, shelters would require a financial review as well as uh, approval from either OCFS or OTDA, depending on the type of shelter. Um, I can defer to Erin if there to, to speak more on the interagency collaboration piece or so this, you know, this, the city's um, future goals. But for right now, the only shelters that are slated to open were those that were approved under the expansion. Erin. Thank you. Um, that's right. So we certainly engage in conversations with our sister agencies, with the mayor's office to end gender based violence. Um, just uh, at last quarter's um, interagency uh, uh, IHAC, uh, the interagency uh, council. Uh, we talked about domestic violence as a driver of homelessness. So had a presentation um, by Natasha and her team, as well as uh, Liz and NGBV. Um, so we're regularly engaged in conversations with our sister agencies and how to address issues that uh, aren't siloed to one particular agency. Um, Liz, I don't know if you want to add anything just since we had the presentation at the IHAC. Yeah, I think you covered it. Thank you. Is there somebody that was gonna speak or answer? Yeah, I'm not sure. With the mask, is, is difficult. Uh, sorry, were you able, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I was saying actually just that Aaron had covered it, so I didn't have anything additional to add. Okay, so I wanna thank all of you for your response. Very broad, um, not succinct at all, um, where we could fully understand uh, the strategy and the process that's utilized. And I've experienced myself, um, that the communications is very lackluster from your agencies and our communities when you're opening shelters, whether it be a domestic violence, a family shelter, a woman shelter, the communication is very lackluster and it's left to us to have the conversation um, with the community. And if you guys can create a better strategy for what this looks like and how we can be more supportive of these residents um, that would be really helpful. And if you need recommendations from us on how to do that, since we have the buy-in and relationships with the community, I, I beg of you, I'm using the word beg, um, please use us as a resource so that we can do a better job in communicating with residents within these uh, particular institutions, but most importantly with the community. Thank you all for your time.
Thank you, Council Member. I really appreciate that feedback. Um, it's very helpful. Um, on community notification as it relates to our domestic violence shelters, um, due to the confidential nature of these locations, we are not at liberty to disclose the locations nor do community engagement on those locations. Um, that stands in contrast to the Department of Homeless Services shelters where we do do notifications um, and work to participate in building uh, you know, community relationships through our community advisory boards and so forth. But due to the confidential nature of our domestic violence shelters, uh, that same approach is not able to be taken due to the safety and security of the clients being served at the shelter. So I appreciate the feedback and happy to follow up on any specifics. Moderator, I see, I see no more. Yes, I uh, guess we are. I, I, sorry, oh, Chair Diaz, I, just, I do want to just. No, go ahead. With, I, I, with I have one, more with one, well. with one, I just, just one, just, just the last remark and just to, to reiterate that um, this cannot be an acceptable outcome that, um, that families that are leaving DV shelter are. Um, eight times more likely to enter the DHS system than to exit with a rental voucher that that they are that they are qualifying for um, um, in most cases. I, I, I don't I mean I don't know if you have the uh, the information of how many uh, what percentage of of um, of clients are leaving the DV system with a city FEP shopping letter, but presumably it's, it's a high percentage. And we cannot, as a city, see that as an acceptable outcome, that, that families are exiting one system and going into another system, and thereby burdening the other system as well, which, um, which continues to have an unacceptably high census within the D, within the the DHS shelter system I mean that, that's it is it is and and to and to there and and it's not then that 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 uh, has a negative effect on those families that are in that system on an average of over 400 days um, because then the resources in those shelters are are having to be divided more ways it it it, it is to the detriment of everybody in the system that families would be discharged from one system, the HREDV system, into the DHS system. It hurts everybody. It hurts the families themselves. It hurts, um, and it and it and it and it hurts the other families that are in the DHS system already because their resources then have to be uh, divided uh, in more ways. And we have an, we have to have a better strategy. This, is, this isn't one person's responsibility. Um, it's not one provider's responsibility. It's not one commissioner, deputy commissioner's responsibility. Um, there has to be um, a greater emphasis and a better strategy. Strategy from city hall, from the deputy mayor, between the two deputy mayors, deputy mayor that is in charge of housing and the deputy mayor that is in charge of social services. There has to be, it is, it, it is extremely frustrating after years and years and years of talking about this that we still have um, these outcomes. And um, it's gonna be up to the next administration and the next council, but I really hope that they put a greater emphasis and more resources into getting more people 
into permanent housing through rental subsidy out of both the HRA DV system and the DHS system. And if anybody's gonna be here after January 1st, please, please put a greater emphasis on this because these, these, these numbers, the numbers speak for themselves. I, I, I'm willing to grant that 2020 was a weird year and low numbers because of still, still, it's, we, we have to do better. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. I'm about to ask some tough questions as well. Only as, as I'm exiting the council and fear the status of the city, when it comes to the city identifying providers that we're not doing due diligence, providers that we know now have, there's nepotism involved, the mismanagement of, of funds. My understanding is that 62 um, nonprofits of the 62, nine are being worked with more specifically. Can someone share with us what does that actually mean when an organization has been, has been flagged? Um, so I'll answer. So the shelter providers that you're speaking about are Department of Homeless Service providers. Um, the larger number are the number of providers who are providing shelter uh, with contracts within the Department of Homeless Services. And the number that you mentioned are uh, organizations that are under corrective action plans um, that we are working uh, with those providers um, on any number of policies uh, to strengthen that organization or those organizations um, to ensure that um, they're providing services uh, to the standards we expect of them. So just for clarity's sake, none of these providers operate DV shelters. Um, I don't have the list of uh, DHS providers under CAPS with me for today's hearing. I'd be happy to cross-reference that against our domestic violence shelter providers and get back to the committee. Please, so the last one I heard of this weekend was Millennium Care. And my understanding is that they are a DV provider. But again, I, I look forward to, to you getting back to me on what those numbers look like, especially since we've indicated that we're not gonna meet the goal by 2021 of providing secure housing for, for DV victims. I have no more questions. I'll, um, after this, I'll turn it over to Councilman Rosenthal that has a question. Unless moderated is anyone else that has a hand raised on the topic of DV shelters itself. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal is at uh, first and the only other member with their hand raised at this time. Time starts now. Thank you. And Chair uh, Diaz, Chair Levin, as usual, thank you for your amazing work um, trying to address <clears throat> the lack of DV shelters, lack of communication with clients and all sundry issues. Um, <clears throat> I very much appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask about my bill, uh, which has to do with a street harassment advisory board. So um, let's see, I don't know if she's still on. Jackie Ebanks provided some great testimony about um, this bill. Uh, if the committee council can help me, are you, is Jackie Ebanks available? No? Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I see Elizabeth Nank is here from NGVV, who I'm sure might have some thoughts about this bill. Um, I'm not actually, I'm not sure if you've read it. I know that Jackie testified and gave what seemed to be very supportive testimony for the bill. Um, one thing that was important to us between the a, uh, the, the initial version and the A version was to specify that the suggestions that are made are are not uh, would not involve the criminal justice system, but instead be focused on um, prevention and and maybe even some restorative justice, although that's not spe specified, but it, it's alluded to. Um, I just wanted to check if the administration 
had any concerns about the bill. None were raised um, by Director Ebanks. Um, does anyone want to make any quick comments or thoughts from the administration? Council member. Um, so yes, um, the administration submitted written testimony in response to the yep. bills. Um, so no oral testimony was given today, but written testimony was submitted. Um, we welcome the opportunity to supplement the city's work around street harassment um, and look forward to further discussing the bill with council. Further discussing because there might be changes that you're thinking of? Um, so there, um, the, the intent of the bill, we definitely support, um, and we support expanded work around street harassment, um, and there are potential areas that we're interested in discussing further with council. Um, the administration needs more time to review and work with council on the bill. Okay, um, I'd hope you'd expedite that. I'm hoping to move this bill very quickly. So if there are concerns, I'm eager to try to address those concerns. You're the experts. Um, we're also going to hear from Hollaback today. I'm excited for them to testify and others. Um, and I look forward to their testimony for to hear about any tweaks or suggestions you have for the legislation. Because as I say, I think, you know, given it's December. I think it's going to be moving rather quickly. Um, and I'd rather, you know, take the time to make sure the bill is as best it can be um, before we pass it into law. So thank you very much for that. I apologize, um, Deputy Commissioner Dink. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Um, but I really am eager for feedback from City Hall about this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Chair Diaz. Really appreciate you. Thank you. I also I, I want to thank Deputy Bank, Dank rather, for acknowledging that you want to have more conversation about the bill. This bill is going to be really impactful. And once most of us are gone, it's into law. So I, I, I like that we're able to show the public that we are interested in having real conversations that are going to affect everyday people. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal and Chair Diaz. Uh, seeing no other council member hands raised, we will turn to public testimony. <clears throat> First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. <clears throat> Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For the first panel public testimony, we will have Gabriela Sandoval Requena from New Destiny Housing, Malka Himmelhawk from Met Council on Jewish Poverty, and Julia Cherznik um, speaking on behalf of GMVA. Uh, Gabriel Requena, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council Member Diaz and Council Member Levin and the members of the Committee on uh, Women and Gender Equity and gen General Welfare. Thank you all, all for your leadership and for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of New Destiny Housing. Uh, my name is Gabriela Sandoval Requena, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst of New Destiny Housing. Our mission is to end the cycle of abuse and homelessness for domestic violence survivors. We do this by developing supportive housing for homeless um, DV survivors, assisting survivors who are fleeing DV to obtain subsidies and find apartments, and by advocating for more housing resources for survivors. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express our gratitude to Council Member DS11 and members of both committees for the demonstrated uh, commitment to help improve the lives of New York City's most vulnerable. I uh, would like to use this time to express our support for intro 3270, um, I'm sorry, 2372 introduced by Council Member Rivera. Uh, this bill would give survivors um, of gender um, motivated acts of violence more time to pursue civil actions. Uh, in the US, 
of uh, women experiencing DV experience financial abuse and face limited uh, financial resources like back credit and first employment history as a result. According to one survey by Safe Horizon, co-occurring economic abuse affects 92% of survivors experiencing homelessness. This bill creates a two-year look-back window for survivors to pursue civil action and redress of the wrongdoing done to them by way of financial help from their abusers. New Destiny supports intro 2372. We'd also like to underscore the need for equitable access to housing resources for survivors of domestic violence. Um, as the uh, Deputy Commissioner stated, uh, the report on exits uh, showed that 449 survived uh, households were streamlined from the HRA system to the DHS system in 2020. However, uh, there are other families that move on their own, bringing the total to about 37%. So we're talking that one of every three households that is in DV shelter ends up going from one shelter system to another. Um, and uh, we, we urge the city to take a much needed steps to expand equitable access to housing, such as allowing HRA shelter residents to um, equal access to HPD homeless set aside units, which would cost the city no additional funding. We thank the council for the opportunity to testify and welcome uh, further collaboration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We will now turn to Maka Hilmahawk. You may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Chair Diaz, Chair Levin, and members of the committee, good morning. My name is Malka Himmelhoch. I'm a policy fellow at the Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty. And I would like to thank Chair Diaz and Chair Levin for holding this very important hearing. I'm here today on behalf of Met Council, first to ask that the New York City Council devote additional resources to expanding DV, the DV shelter system, and then to speak briefly in support of int number 2372A. For almost 50 years, Met Council has provided comprehensive social services to New Yorkers in need. Since the start of 2021, we have provided services to more than 300,000 people, including 1,117 survivors of family violence. As we are all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated already existing problems in our city. This is especially true in the realm of domestic violence. Since the start of the pandemic, there has been a 50% increase in the number of clients reaching out to our family violence program for help. Not only have we seen a rise in the number of clients contacting us for assistance, but we've also seen a disturbing rise in the severity of their cases. More clients have reported being threatened by a weapon, strangled and raped than ever before, in addition to experiencing increasingly egregious incidents of humiliation and embarrassment. It's evident that our families in crisis urgently need additional support and expanded services. As family violence providers, our first priority is using a trauma-informed lens to create a safety plan, Often this includes survivors leaving them homes frequently with children. Finding shelter for survivors without children is especially challenging since HRV DV shelters prioritize families over single adults. In September, 2021, HRA sheltered over a thousand families but only 95 single adults. As a result, our social workers are often only able to find these people beds in DHS shelters. And as we've discussed, those resources are very limited as compared to the DV shelters. While getting survivors to safety is always a top priority, it's both disruptive and additionally traumatic for someone who has already had to leave their home to be forced to leave their community and city to be safe. Additionally, the committee should be aware that in several cases, our clients who live in NYCHA housing have had to wait between six months and a year after being granted an emergency transfer order to move into a new safe apartment. This egregious delay puts a greater burden on an already overstretched shelter system that will likely become even more overburdened as the eviction moratorium ends in January 15th, 2022. We're calling on the city council to dedicate additional funding in order to increase the number of HRA DV shelter beds. Prior to the pandemic, there are at least 12,000 DV survivors being housed in DHS shelters. And as we've heard, that number has not been significantly decreased. We would ask that HRA try to increase the number of beds to accommodate the growing demand for shelter. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Juliana Cheresnik. Time starts now. Hello and good afternoon to Council Member Rivera, Council Member Brooks Powers, 
members of the committee and everyone in the meeting room today. My name is Juliana Chernick and I'm a rape survivor. In the fall of 2020, during my senior year at Fordham University, I attended a college party and while incapacitated and unconscious, due to alcohol and recreational substances, I was sexually assaulted by a peer. College rape is a huge problem and leaves victims in limbo. It took me a few months to process and realize what had happened to me, which means I didn't have the concrete evidence that cases typically need to move forward in criminal court. But how was I supposed to know and grasp all of that in the, in the hours after recovering from the assault? Once I had finally processed my trauma enough to come forward, I chose to report the incident to my university and the NYPD six months after. Neither pursuit provided a successful outcome. The biggest issue came when I sought to press criminal charges and an ADA told me that they wouldn't pursue my case unless they were certain they would win. Because the burden of proof is different in the civil context, I have been able to pursue my case civilly. The same is not true for survivors who, have take, who take even longer to process their sexual assaults than I did. We need to amend this legislation so that victims have the ability to pursue justice through civil lit litigation, because as my case shows, other of avenues often fails to bring abusers to justice. I beg of you, committee members, to vote yes and help not just me, but countless people in similar situations to receive the recompense they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, testimony and willing to, to speak your truth to power. It sounds to me that as if you had not taken the matters into your own hands, you wouldn't be where you are today. So thank you for your willingness to find the fight and the, the internal courage, which at times many individuals don't have. And thank you for, it's a big deal to, to be among so many of us today telling your story, which honestly opens the door to someone else who may be in your situation and needs the strength. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank I you appreciate that. Efforts. No, you're, you're welcome. I mean, I thank you. I, I receive text messages often from survivors after hearings like this that, that are grateful and seeing an image of themselves stepping forward. So thank, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to ask if Chair Levin has any questions before we turn to other council member questions for this panel. I don't, thank you very much, moderator. Thank you. And thank you very much to this, to this panel for your, your very important testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We will now call on council member Rosenthal for her question. Hi, thank you. Thank you. It's not really a question. I also want to really thank the survivor for coming forward. Change doesn't happen without your sharing your truth, as Chair Diaz just said. Um, but you are going to make a difference today and um, make a difference not just on this bill, but on a variety of issues. Um, the DAs and NYPD, their sex crimes unit, have a long way to go. And um, by your stepping forward, it helps to validate that issue. Um, so we really need you. And um, again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Chair Diaz? I have a, a question from Met Council. Are they still on the daytime off? Are they still on, Chloe? I'm looking. Okay. Malka. I believe she had a she had something to do, so she she logged off. Okay. So then um we'll just email for public knowledge. What I'm my, my question to ask is I I like to know within the intake process, can they share with us how many um are had a male head of household and how many of male are they've engaged with and had a conversation with this week. Transparent, um, I'm on a pursuit to establish that men are also victims uh, of domestic violence and all data that I can gather, I, I, I wanna gather. I'm on a mission to make sure we have equity uh, across the board, so thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other council member hands raised, we will turn to the next public panel. 
And first we will have Deborah Berkman from the New York Legal Assistance Group, Claire Plunkett from Sanctuary for Families, and Jessica Sell Chambers. Uh, Deborah Plunk. Sorry, Deborah Berkman, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you. Chairs Diaz, Levin, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak to the committees on women and gender equality and gender welfare on the DV shelter system. My name is Deborah Berkman and I am the coordinating attorney of the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at NILAG or the New York Legal Assistance Group. Based on my experience working with survivors of domestic violence experiencing homelessness, I appreciate this opportunity to offer these comments. And the most important thing that I have to say is that the city must increase access to DV shelter. There are simply not enough beds in the DV shelter system. At NILAG, we counsel numerous survivors of domestic violence who reach out to us for safety planning. We see them firsthand navigate the difficult decision of whether to leave their home, often many of their belongings, their community, and the financial stability they have to leave abusive situations. Once they make this courageous leap, to be told that the DV shelter system can't accommodate them has an inevitable chilling effect, as well as long-term tangible consequences to their ability to achieve stability and security. When the DV shelter system can't accommodate survivors, they must choose between entering the DHS shelter system or staying in an abusive situation. DHS shelter uh, staff is not trauma-informed and does not appear to be trained to meet the needs of those fleeing DV. Moreover, DHS shelters are not in confidential locations and they don't provide services tailored to protecting the safety of survivors of domestic violence. Many survivors will decide not to leave an abusive relationship to enter the DHS system because they fear they are going from one unsafe location to another, especially since they're at their most vulnerable for lethal intimate partner violence at the time of separation. And as Council Member Diaz pointed out, uh, there are very few beds in the DV shelter system for anyone other than cisgender female survivors with young children. Similarly, survivors who have religious and dietary restrictions are most often not able to be accommodated by the DHS, the DV shelter system. Our DV shelter system has to be expanded to increase capacity overall, but specifically must be in, expanded to include capacity to serve survivors from all backgrounds and from all experiences. Additionally, DV shelter stage, a stage should not have a time limit, and in no circumstance should that time limit be 180 days. In the midst of the COVID pandemic, New York has removed mandatory time limits for shelter stays, and this must be made permanent. It's almost impossible for our clients to find permanent housing within 180 days of entering DV shelter. And as we spoke of earlier, the most common housing voucher is a city VEBS housing voucher, which the survivors are not eligible for until they've resided in the shelter for at least 90 days. Thus, for most of my clients, for the first half of their stays in shelter, they're functionally ineligible to search for housing. And even after the clients become eligible for a rental voucher, it can take many months to secure an apartment. Difficulty obtaining permanent housing can be exacerbated for our clients who are survivors of domestic violence because many are involved in family court proceedings. Um, and the court may place geographic limitations where a parent may reside. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Ms. Beckman, do you have further testimony? I do have a client story that I'd like to tell you about. And, about I, and I want to hear it. I'm on about, about Thank facts. You. Thank, you Thank you very you. much. So one of our clients at NILEG, his name is Jenna, and she has a special needs child who needs, among other therapies, regular home care and, and a number of therapies that come to the house. She fled an abusive relationship to enter a DV shelter. And when Jenna's 180 days were nearing an end, her child's father filled, uh, filed an emergency petition seeking custody, noting how the child may have his necessary services interrupted for a second time within six months because they had to leave the DV shelter. The court was extremely concerned about the welfare of the child and the instability of the child's services. Jenna greatly feared losing temporary custody. So in order to avoid that outcome, she actually moved back in with her abuser. Jenna felt that if she were home, she could protect her, her child. And if the father was awarded custody and had the child alone without her protection, then the child would be in danger. And all of this occurred because Jenna was limited to only 180 days in her DV shelter. Thank you for allowing me to share that client experience and for allowing me to testify. I, I thank you for providing um, facts. It's, it's clear to me that you're dedicated and, and thank you for that. Thank you for wearing your heart on your sleeve and, and making a difference. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Claire Plunkett. Time Good starts afternoon. now. Good afternoon. My name is Claire Plunkett, and I'm a clinical supervisor for DV emergency shelters at Sanctuary for Families, New York State's largest provider of comprehensive services exclusively for abuse survivors and their children. We're grateful to the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. We want to give special thanks to Dharma Diaz, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, and Stephen Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare, for their strong advocacy on behalf of abuse survivors in the Council, and to former Women and Gender Equity Committee Chair Helen Rosenthal for her equally resolute efforts in that role. For almost 30 years, Sanctuary has run a large 58-family DV transitional shelter and four small DV crisis shelters. Together, provide safe, confidential residents for 350 to 400 adults and children annually. At the height of the pandemic, during which DV survivors were disproportionately affected, in addition to the challenges and trauma they already faced recovering from abuse, Sanctuary deeply appreciated HRA's responsiveness and expanded support for our clients. Sanctuary shelter staff were in daily communication with the HRA Emergency Intervention Services Unit. They provided PPE supplies, helped us quickly procure remote learning tech, and responded rapidly and compassionately in the event of a COVID case or exposure. HRA also relaxed rigid rules to accommodate shelter residents with COVID infections in hotels if needed and ensured reimbursement in cases where rooms in shared apartments had to be left vacant to avoid exposure. HRA has been a longtime partner of Sanctuary, particularly during the pandemic, and we truly appreciate their dedicated EIS staff. However, as others have been stating so far, our shelter clients continue to experience many of the same challenges we've highlighted in the past, particularly in their struggles to secure and maintain affordable permanent housing after exiting shelter. One of the primary obstacles our shelter clients face is navigating the housing subsidy system, including FEPS, City FEPS, Section 8, and NYCHA. This is especially concerning given that the federal and state eviction moratoriums will likely end soon. So the city FEPS voucher increase in September 2021 up to federal Section 8 fair market rent levels was a critical step forward. Certain program requirements make it difficult for the low income survivors we serve to participate. Apartment size requirements based on family size and composition can force families to search for unnecessarily large apartments that are over the voucher limit. For example, a one bedroom apartment would not be permissible for a single father with a daughter, whereas a mother with a son would be eligible to sleep in the same room. And while the city FEPS voucher recently increased, the FEPS vouchers are still only 1,580 for a family of four, which is incredibly low in the New York City rental market. Too often, shelter residents who are on a path to economic stability and independence find that working to support their families can lead to exclusion or removal from voucher programs because their income is too high, a formula which is triggered at levels far below comfortable living wages. Additionally, a number of EIS staff vacancies at HRA, including Next many slide. to, um, is it, should I end here? Not sure. Um, I'll finish up quickly. Um, just speaking about hoping that HRA EIS uh, staff vacancies can be filled quickly so that voucher response times and approvals for other benefits for shelter residents can happen in a timely manner. Um, so finally, we would just like to uh, ask HRA to take these con concrete steps and city council to work with them, uh, revising voucher, housing voucher guidelines to make the program more accessible to low-income survivors, increase staff capacity at HRA, advocate for more funding for crucial shelter supportive services, including therapeutic services, and increase DV shelter options for single abuse survivors. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your unwavering commitment to abuse survivors and New Yorkers in need. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we will hear from Jessica Sell Chambers. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank all of the chairs, moderators and council members for the work that you're doing. I too am a councilwoman in my um, town. And I understand that sometimes this is a thankless job, and um, but it is much needed. So thank you, truly from the bottom of my heart. Um, I want to share that um, I was a victim of a doctor. I was in 2004, I was a 23 year old student at the City College of New York. And I 
thought that I was, it was time for me to see my first OBGYN. I had seen nurse practitioners at Planned Parenthood and I thought it was just time for me to graduate um, to a formal doctor. Um, I was fresh out of a breakup. I went into this doctor's office. Um, he asked me all about it. He was very warm and welcoming and engaging. And um, afterwards he, he made personal calls to me to check on me. Um, I had no idea at the time that what was happening to me was absolutely inappropriate and unusual and abusive. Um, I had no idea that he was grooming me. Um, I thought that what had happened to me was perhaps invited by me, that it was um, my fault. Like I said, I was 23, I was young, I was naive, I was inexperienced. Instead, I just never went back to see him. I didn't answer his phone calls. Um, but to this day, I'm 40 years old now, and I can see this man's face, I can see his hands, it's graphic, it's visceral. Um, and yet I had no idea that any of it wasn't my fault back then. So how could I have come forward? How could I have um, sought help when I was experiencing all of the same things that victims and survivors like me experience? Um, what is craziest to me is that Columbia University, who was his employer, had known about his deplorable and sick actions um, from as early as 1994. And what happened to me never needed to happen if the university, if the institution had taken the action that would have been appropriate at the time. And his actions only became more egregious and sicker as time went on. Um, so that said, I thank all of you. And on behalf of the hundreds of his patients and the countless survivors and victims generally, um, that you please take action at, with the GMBA to allow all of us to seek justice in situations like this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I will now ask for council members to raise hands if they have any questions for this panel before turning to Chair Diaz. Seeing no hands raised, we will move on to the next panel. In order of speaking, we have Natalie Rubio Torrio. Jean Sun and Diana Prashad. I apologize for the uh, commotion in the background. Uh, Natalie Rubio Thordio, you may start when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Diaz, Chair Levy, and Councilman Rosenthal for the opportunity to be able to give my testimony on behalf of Introduction, introduction Bill 2424. My name is Natalie Rubio Torrio. I'm the Executive Director of Voces Latinas. We do HIV and violence prevention, so we do have a lot to say around domestic violence prevention, in particular uh, to um, victims that are undocumented and in the country less than two years. But for today, I want to speak a little bit more about my personal experience with street harassment and um, some of my, this is what the testimony has to do with today. Um, first, thank you so much for your time. This is a very serious topic that many individuals experience, yet most don't talk about. When it, appeared, when it happened to me, I became silent, shocked, and never really told anyone. It took me a long time to understand and realize the seriousness of this harassment. As a young person, I had my share of incidences where I was harassed and actually assaulted on the street and on the subway and all on my way to work. The helplessness I felt on top of the fear is something that one never forgets. Now, as a mom of two daughters, one 18 years old and the other 22, I see it happening to them. Uh, one could never forget as a mom when your child calls you and is afraid on the street saying these men were just yelling out these obscenities to me, what do I do? 
that is constantly in my head and I will never forget what the, what the uh, advice I gave to her. I t- told her to go into a store, just ask for help if she needs help, but to be with people and not be alone. Some, a mom should never have to go through this. But today it looks quite different with the technology that exists, such as social media, dating sites, apps. The harassment has even it's even more extreme, making one feel total totally helpless. And even reporting the incident is is it is is hard to come by. My daughter's friends also have their pictures stolen and placed on porn sites, dating sites, and my other daughter had someone impersonating her on social media. It's so difficult to report these incidents, and that's why it's becoming so much easier for indi- individuals to get away with it. Additionally, street harassment has not changed since my days. I see it almost every day on the streets of Roosevelt Avenue in Queens. The words and statements young girls need to hear is damaging. It not only sexualizes them at such a young age, but these girls are left confused with su- such messages. No one should have to experience this on their way to school, on their way to work, or just having a walk on the street. So I thank you again for this time to listen to my testimony. And I thank you for taking this serious, this issue very seriously. If I may, Ms. Nadi Rubio Torrio, thank you for, for sharing your story, but also breaking down what the harassment looks like. Many of us will overlook situations that you share with us and not know that we're victims right? because it's that we have not heard the conversation prior. So again, thank you. Thank you for breaking it down. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Jean Sun. Time starts now. It appears you're still muted. Hi, sorry. Um, thank you to Councilmember Diaz and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and the Committee on General Welfare for honoring our request for this hearing. Um, my name is Jean Sun and I grew up in Queens. Um, my first experience with street harassment happened when I was 11 years old. I was walking hand in hand with my mom down Main Street in Flushing when a man grabbed me. My mom noticed what happened a few seconds later. She yelled at him in Korean. Um, I remember the helplessness in her voice. Um, knowing that he didn't understand her, that he was already halfway down the street and would not be turning back. Um, We've heard a lot of similar stories over the past year and speaking to other advocates for this bill. Um, Some of the most heartbreaking were from those who happen to be parents, like Natalie, for example, um, the worry that men are taking photos of their daughters at the gym or, you know, looking at them inappropriately in public, looking at children um, in a way that reflects my own mother's experience. Um, The stories from the LGBT community in particular, including the times that transgender folk, for example, were gawked at or verbally targeted um, or had photos taken of them in public turn up without their consent on sex work websites are really chilling and open my eyes to how street harassment affects the most vulnerable populations and how thus far there's been little recourse for these people. Um, So I'm personally very happy to see this bill up for vote and I hope everyone on the council understands why it's necessary. Um, As we wrote in our letter to you, respectful, equitable conduct in public is a learned behavior. Um, Thank you so much for listening and for your support of this important legislation. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Diana Prashat. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Prashat. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address the committee members. I would like to bring my safety and quality of life issue to the attention of this committee that my household has been enduring close to two years at the hands of illegally placed DSS clients in a townhouse bound by a 25-year owner occupancy clause. DSS has been paying that homeowner who is in an active contract with HPD to breach her owner occupancy provisions to house their clientele from March 2020 to present. My wife and I have been placed in a very dangerous situation as owners of the adjacent property by these illegally placed DSS clients who have been threatening our safety, damaged our property, have been habitually rushing out to attack us in and around our property. There were threats made to hit our parked vehicle on January 1st, 2021. These threats were realized when our parked vehicle was deliberately hit at 1.40 a.m. DSS clients 
have been dealing drugs out of the premises, have been running an illegal dare care, and have been operating an illegal car rental business from the premises. My wife and I have been and continue to be disparaged based on our sexual orientation, have been threatened with bodily harm, and some of these threats by DSS clients, parents and children included, were verbalized in the presence of the NYPD. HPD and DSS are aware of these issues since March 17, 2020, yet have failed to address them and have cited us as complainers as though we have no right to complain being thus targeted by these DSS clients. I would like to add that other homeowners on my block have also complained about the degradation of our lives by these DSS clients to the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs. As LGBTQ black homeowners and taxpayers, we have seen that there are gaps in legislation that fail to protect us, hence in over 20 months of ongoing harassment by DSS's illegally placed clientele, we as homeowners have no reprieve to obtain a protective order against our ongoing safety issues, which are couched in intolerance, hate speech, homophobia, and active threats of harm. As LGBTQ homeowners who are likewise subject to a homeowner occupancy clause binding us to our property for 25 years, and who have been actively dealing with issues of stranger violence, threats, and homophobia for over 20 months via this illegally placed DSS family into a home bound by the self-same occupancy clauses, there are no protections for us. All laws that exist governing harassment must be precipitated by the actualization of physical violence, which means that they are reactive rather than preemptive. As a part of a disenfranchised group of citizenry being both black and LGBTQ, we have been on the receiving end of a very dangerous situation that was literally brought to our doorstep by DSS, and more needs to be done to address deficiencies in laws that do not offer any protection to individuals like me who are dealing with protracted harassment issues and intersecting issues of hate, violence, induced hate by DSS clients. Additionally, this committee needs to address harassment legislations that are so skewed that taxpayers have to be harmed or killed before harassment can be addressed. In an age where our community of LGBTQ continues to be killed at an unprecedented rate due to hate and ignorance, these archaic laws must be amended. There is no way that as an LGBTQ family that we should be enduring 20 months of ongoing harassment and threats by DSS clients devoid of legal ramifications. Please continue, Ms. Prasad. Okay. Legislation has to be put in place that protects citizenry from targeted acts of harassment by DSS clients, and a code of conduct needs to be underwritten into law governing the social services clientele with corresponding loss of aid so that there are real-life consequences for these targeted acts of harassment. There is no way that this DSS family should have been allowed to persist with 21 months of harassment homophobic threats after being illegally displaced into our community of working class, law-abiding taxpayers, yet are able to retain their benefits and are devoid of consequences. Our experiences at the hands of DSS and HPD are very reminiscent of the attitude of this administration under de Blasio that is geared towards chaos and lawlessness. We are tired of paying taxes and participating in a city that does not care for its citizenry unless we are moneyed or politically connected. And as a committee presiding on general welfare, you have to do a better job at addressing issues that regular citizenry are dealing with, referencing mismanagement, abuse of power, harassment by DSS wards, as promulgated by agencies under your purview, particularly since my wife and I have reached out to some of you directly. As a woman of color and LGBTQ, my wife and I have and continue to feel the effects of being marginalized, oppressed discriminated and retaliated against under the de Blasio administration and living in the 21st century in New York City. This should not be the case. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm baffled by, by your story. Okay. Um, at many levels, please feel free to reach my office directly. I, I like to have meaningful, direct, specific conversation with the administration. I, I'm alarmed um, just to think, to phantom, that your case was elevated and it was not looked upon. That's, that's an issue. I'm a big advocate on both sides of the law and this is just not okay. Again, this Councilwoman Diaz, and I'll, I'll give you my email address but if you don't have it, is ddiaz at councilnyc.gov. I urge you to allow me to, to assist you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to add one more witness to this panel, and that would be Emily May from Hollaback. Time starts now. 
Thank you so much for the invitation to join uh, this panel. And I also, before I get started, um, just want to make sure I take a second to thank Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Van Bramer, Public Advocate Williams, Councilmember Levin, and Councilmember Kumbo, who have worked tirelessly on the issue of street harassment for the past 10 years. And I also especially want to thank Jean Sun for her exceptional leadership in shepherding this bill forward. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Emily May. I am the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback. We are working to end harassment in all of its forms, including the very problem that intro 2424 is designed to tackle, street harassment. Over the past two years alone, we've trained about 20,000 New York City residents in how to intervene when they see street harassment happening. We've done this work in partnership with L'Oreal Paris and the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. Initial research that we've done in partnership with the New York City Commission on Gender Equity shows that 75% of the people who witness street harassment after attending our training tell us that they successfully intervene. That's an amazing outcome that we're so proud of, especially in light of the fact that many people mistake street harassment as a problem that has no solution. And while it can impact anybody, I do want to acknowledge today that those most impacted are the people who are most marginalized in our community, people of color, LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, religious minorities, young people, and more. And the solution that most policymakers turn to is criminalization. But we know, and the advocates here today know, and the council members who co-sponsored this bill knows, that criminalizing street harassment only stands to further marginalized communities already at risk, and it has never been demonstrated to reduce the incidences or the impact of street harassment. Intro 2424 offers a bold new solution because it puts the job of creating solutions in the hands of advocates and community members who know this issue best. It's explicit in its intention to examine street harassment from an intersectional approach and without unnecessary increases in policing and criminalization. We saw a similar bill passed in DC in 2018, and that bill paved the way for a host of improvements in DC's approach to this issue. By adopting this bill, New York City will become a global model for innovative and community-led approaches to street harassment. And the time to act is now. According to a recent study by Ipsos and L'Oreal Paris, almost one in three women, 31%, said they faced street harassment in 2020. And that figure jumps to 46% when you start to capture those between the ages of 18 and 34. Even in the wake of this global pandemic, street harassment persists, and so must we. Thank you all. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to council member questions, I'd like to ask the chairs if they have any questions for this panel. Seeing no questions from the chairs, let's turn to Council Member Rosenthal for her question. Thank you uh, so much. I just want to thank, first of all, of course, everyone on the panel for uh, sharing your story, sharing your support. Um, all, all, uh, before I get to Hollaback, the three personal stories, um, the, the diversity that was um, shared in terms of the form of street harassment shows why there's no one excellent answer and why it's so important that we have robust participation and um, discussion on, on this advisory panel. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I would ask if you could uh, to submit your testimony um, to make sure it's submitted for the, rec for the record. I don't think it's been submitted yet. So if you could submit it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. If you don't feel comfortable uh, submitting it for some reason, if you could send it to me for my records because um, I, I really heard what you said. There were a couple of phrases that, that I thought were awfully important that I would like to reread, rethink about. Um, so my email 
addresses H. Rosenthal at council.nyc.gov. Um, Emily, as always, thank you. Thanks to Hollaback for all your work. Um, your prevention work is remarkable. Um, as I've said in other hearings, I hope you get reimbursed um, by the city for all the work you do. I know your trainings um, are in so many agencies. Um, so I really hope you're being properly remunerated. Um, but you hit on two points that I think we were not sufficiently addressed in the initial version of the bill, but now in the A version, I think we've captured it, but I just want to confirm with you. Um, the two issues were making sure there was a good, robust advisory board, and secondly, that criminal, criminal justice solution not be part of the conversation. Are you satisfied with the A version of the bill? I am. I am. I think the A version of the bill is great and really addresses those two key issues that are so important. We really, um, we really want to be leaders here in New York City and and say clearly, both to our own communities and to the rest of the world, that criminalizing this issue is absolutely not the answer, that we have in our own communities better answers than that. And we want to get those community members most impacted to be the ones really shaping those communities. And I think that that combo pack of those two issues is what's going to really make this bill um, successful and in alignment with, with our values and, and really you know a, a light for the rest of the world to model itself after. Thank you for that. Um, and by the way, your oral testimony was more robust than your written testimony. If you have an updated version, if you two could submit that for the record and certainly to myself, I'm interested in hearing about, we don't have to talk about it now, but I'm very interested in hearing about the alternative suggestions that were formulated by the DC advisory panel. Um, we have a lot to learn, and um, now we have an opportunity to uh, move these ideas forward. So, uh, so as not to reinvent the wheel, if if you can provide the advisory council with the first agenda item of ideas for its first meeting, that would be incredibly helpful. And um, I'd be very interested in seeing what those are as well. So I look forward to following up with you about that. Chair Diaz, thank you so much for giving me, uh, uh, for giving all of us the opportunity to hear this bill, solicit feedback, really have appreciated all your support in the last few years. No, it's definitely um, impressive. I, I thank you for the conversation. and. But going back, you know, and, and saying it has to be fine-tuned, I, I think we're going to be in a better place once this is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other council member hands raised, we will turn to the next public panel testimony. In order of speaking, we will hear from Jessica Ibke, Adina S., and Susan Krimmler. Uh, Jessica Igby, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Hi, thank you very much for this opportunity. Good afternoon, Council Member Rivera, Council Member Brooks, uh, Powers Committee members and guests. My name is Jessica Igby, and I am a former resident of Brooklyn, where I grew up in the 1980s with my father and stepmother. I grew up around the Jewish community in the 1980s, often attending services at the Chabad Lubavitch headquarters in 770 New York Place um, Synagogue. My father began working for a permanent member of the Chabad community named Hirsch Bikar in 1991. Bikar was a silver myth who created one of the most influential pieces of Jewish artwork of the 20th century, a six foot gilded menorah that sits till this day in the Chabad Lubavitch headquarters as we speak. Each year during Hanukkah services, masses of people came and marveled at the lighting of this menorah. 
Um, this service till this day is broadcast to millions all over the world. Today exactly is the first day of Hanukkah. This night is the second lighting. I could tell you that I woke up last night, uh, nightmare, and, and looked at the hours. And this is like seven gap hour. And I woke up just as um, people light in New York. What none of these people knew until recently is that the celebrated man who crafted such a dazzling structure had also molested me over a dozen times when I was only six years old. They did not know that the rabbinical court had found him guilty of wrongdoing and my molestation as well as in the assault of other young girls and yet did nothing to punish him. Only in the past years while living here in Israel, I started realizing the reasons for my struggle with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and an eating disorder for many years. But what could I do? I was already been, it's been too many years now and there was really nothing I could do about it in the state. I found out about the Child Victim Act shortly before the August 14th deadline and rushed to file a lawsuit against him before time ran out. Then just two weeks before the deadline and on the evening of our filing, filing Hirschbikar died. I was lucky to have found out about the Child Victim Act before a deadline, but I know that many other survivors were not so lucky. Now they have to recourse. They must co continue to suffer in silence as I suffered unless you vote amend the Gender motivation, motiv Motivated Violence Act. And upon a two year look back window for some survivors. Thank Please you. Please allow her more time if need be. That was basically it. I could only say that I have been pressuring the 770 headquarters uh, with, with, with dear Susan and, and me myself with a lot of pressure um, from inside to take down this menorah. They would not even answer. And, and they're just like, you're just keeping it up and lighting it this night too. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Adina S. Time starts now. Hi. I cannot begin to thank everyone for all the support we've, we've received thus far. Speaking publicly and getting this bill passed was in, incredibly cathartic. If only we'd been granted the opportunity six years ago as we've been promised. Going public and having it televised was scarier, but worth it. Because if we keep abuse hush-hush, then we keep it stigmatized. We decrease the chances of victims coming forward and we reduce the chances of things ever changing. I don't know why this happened to me, um, but I do know that speaking this past July was huge for me. I took the biggest step from PTSD into post-traumatic growth. Trauma keeps things keeps you locked in the past. And believe me, it gets dark there. Hopelessness feeds trauma while time, support, and professional help and action can heal. July 29, 2021 was the first time in 15 years that I felt hope, that I felt alive. Never ever let anyone take your power, right? Well, right now, our laws do just that. They basically say too little, too, too late. Processing trauma takes time. And this works in the predator's favor and against the victims. Um, I didn't realize, by the way, that some of you guys didn't see um, what my, I spoke publicly last time when the bill was introduced and I spoke about how my gynecologist um, molested me. Um, a, well, I had three babies with him. So, okay, so now I'll continue. Do you know what trauma abuse, sexual abuse does to a person? It is often an invisible poison. It leaves no visible scars. It seeps in undetected and is often a silent killer. You may not even know what's happened, especially when it's carried out over time. Instead of support and sympathy, you question your own sanity and those around you will often do the same. <sighs> Victims of trauma are more likely to self-harm or to numb themselves than to get help. 
It is the most perfect crime because our laws currently facilitate the perfect cover-up. Most often, by the time the trauma is processed, it's too late to do anything about it, and the predators know it. Shall we discuss PTSD? Even if we are lucky enough to get the proper therapy, we can never control every outside trigger. How exhausting is it to be, hyper to be hypervigilant at all times, dissociating from life, surviving but not thriving? How far, how far many, how, how for many it's easier to feel nothing at all than to risk feeling joy and its counterpart, pain. How for me personally, when I allow myself to feel joy, I get slapped with horrible flashbacks and migraines. How the more I face it, the more it hurts. But the more I run, the more it hurts too. There's no way out. I'm stuck in this, in this horrific vortex. I can't erase it or undo it. So what then? Just accept it. Accept that it just wasn't fair. Accept that I was taught to accept life's not fair instead of being taught to fight for justice. Because when I did fight back, justice laughed in my face when Haddon got a plea deal behind our backs, as if the law was saying, told you so. So what exactly was I taught? Compliance? Deference? It's time for change. Gender, racial, and religious biases cannot make us targets and then be used as excuses. The GMVA press conference and introduction of the, amend of the, of the amendment was step one but we need to get the bill passed. Let's get rid of these ridiculously short statutes of, statutes of limitations, prioritize justice for victims and survivors over the comfort of rapists and criminals, and help New York City serve as an example for the rest of the country to follow. Let's show New York and the rest of the world that we see you. You aren't alone, your pain is real, and the law understands that internal pain is just as valid as external pain. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening and hearing us. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we will hear from Susan Kramiller. Um, Hi, Susan thank you. Uh, I'm only here today for the sole purpose of respectfully reading into the record the following written testimony which was submitted by Farzana Farooq. Oh, My name is Farzana Farooq. I am a 33-year-old woman born in Bangladesh. I emigrated to the United States in 2000 at age 13. When my family moved to Jackson Heights, they became acquainted with a well-known and respected doctor in the Bangladeshi community, Dr. Ferdus Kondakar in Jackson Heights. I regularly visited Dr. Kondifer's facility for annual checkups, usually with my mother. On March 27, 2009, when I was 21 years old, I went to see Kondifer alone. I had a sore, th sore throat and difficulty breathing. When I arrived, Kondifer told me that he would check my breathing in my chest. He told me to sit on the examination table and stretch my legs out and place his stethoscope on my chest. Kondiker then directed me to lower my shirt. He lowered my bra and took my breasts out of my bra, one at a time. I felt paralyzed and tried to process what was going on. Afterwards, I left and never returned to the office. In June, 2020, I saw a Facebook post lauding Kondikar for his COVID-related work in the Bengali community. I became distraught as I remembered how Kondikar had assaulted me in 2009. Around this time, many other individuals came forward with their own stories of Kondikar's predatory conduct against themselves, their mothers, their grandmothers. A class action lawsuit was filed against Kondikar for claims of sexual assault, gender-motivated violence, and medical malpractice. However, I was, only, I was only able to participate as a non-party witness because as the law currently stands, the statute of limitations on my own claims had run out before I could file them. As with so many of the other women Kondikar had also abused without repercussion. Kondikar has a strong influence over the Bangladeshi community in Jackson Heights 
and for years, he has used his power and resources to intimidate and bully his victims into silence. I am telling my story today in hopes of shedding light on the many survivors of gender-motivated violence whose claims are time-barred and who are unable to get the resolution and justice that they deserve. I urge you to please move forward with the resolution to create a two-year window for revived civil action under the Gender Motivated Violence Act so that survivors of violence, like myself, may get the justice we deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. Uh, before I turn it to Chair Diaz or Chair Levin for their questions, do any other council members have any questions? You may use the raise hand function in Zoom. Chair Diaz. Hi, Frankie, I, I have no, no questions. I, I'm, I'm lost for words. I mean, the last testimony, again, was really heartfelt. I, I um, represent a big piece of my district is of the Bengali community. So I unfortunately know firsthand of the suffrage that occurs and is underreported. So again, thank you for, for telling the story. And this hearing thank is definitely you. about opening doors and breaking, breaking the silence. Thank you. I have no questions. Uh, seeing no other council member hands. I raised. think council member Rosenthal is speaking, but I, don't, I think she's on mute. I think it's possible she's uh, on another hearing. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, we will now turn to the next public panel. Uh, first, we have Julie Johanna, followed by Tanisha Johnson, and then Ingrid H. Uh, Julie Johanna, you may start once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Johanna Piotrowski. I'm a former New Yorker and I'm a sexual assault survivor. Thank you to Chair. I'm so sorry. I was testifying on another hearing. I was multitasking. So Chair Diaz, I think you asked me a question, did you? And I'm really sorry that I looked like I wasn't responding. I was talking with someone about ASL. Yeah, uh, it's so okay. It's okay. I know they were multitasking. The question was, um, if you we thought you had, Chair Levin understood you had a question. And if you do, I need you to hold your question so we can continue the testimony of Ms. Julie Johanna. If you do have a question, Chair Levin, is that okay with I you? I think that that was my mistake. I apologize. No, no, I thought the same thing. I thought I saw the hand up. So, okay. Thank you. Ms. Juliana, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Johanna Piotrowski. I'm a former New Yorker and I'm a sexual assault survivor. Thank you to Chair Diaz for calling this important hearing and to the council members Rivera and Brooks Powers for advancing this bill, for the opportunity to speak in support of creating a two-year look back window for the GMBA. Trauma happens to us, to all of us, as we've heard to our families, to our neighbors. We've heard some of the tough statistics this morning around domestic violence and assault. I've learned so much from the discussion and it gives me hope for New York City, especially in these difficult times, to know that city leadership is working hard with advocates to care for citizens and with real integrity to make policy work for people. So what happened to me? I was sexually assaulted by gynecologist, Dr. Robert Haddon at Columbia University. I've never said this in public before. Not only was I assaulted, I was assaulted repeatedly over the course of five years. He was my first real gynecologist. I was both a graduate student and a full-time employee at the university. I was young and I was sexually inexperienced. What happened to you, to those you love, to others you may know, you might have some memories or painful stories told or untold. Regardless of the types of traumas that all of us experience in life or where we experience them in our homes, our schools, our churches, our workplaces, other institutions, we know that one thing that all of us who are survivors have in common is that it takes tremendous energy to keep functioning while carrying with us the memory of terror 
of shame, of utter weakness and vulnerability. And this is why, and science tells us, so many people repress memories of their difficult feelings around the violence and abuse that they experience. Transformation to heal, to push forward, requires brutal honesty with oneself and with others to face very painful truths. And while it might be uncomfortable, what isn't faced generally can't be resolved. So we repress until we are ready to face the truth. But this process takes longer for some than for others and for so many reasons. Some people have better coping mechanisms or social support or financial resources. As Councilwoman Carlina Rivera powerfully said, there is no timeline for processing trauma. That's why amending the GMVA is so important to allow for civil actions to be filed that formerly may have taken place beyond the statute of limitations. As leaders, as legislators, as members of the greater New York City community, it is not our business to determine how quickly and effectively people should be processing the trauma that happened to them or to compare their abilities with others. It is our business, it is our duty to provide safe environments in which people can thrive. And it is our business to provide the conditions under which, including in our legal system, people may pursue action and justice when they're willing and able and when they have the courage and the conviction to pursue action. In I, summary, there is no timeline on processing trauma. Not passing this bill means we would be denying what it means to be fundamentally human and denying the research and the science that it takes some of us longer than others, not only to come forward, but to tell our story. Please pass this bill to allow survivors of gender motivated violence the opportunity that they deserve to seek justice in civil court. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Tanisha Johnson. You may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Good morning. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. The Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act says that gender motivated violence inflicts serious physical, psychological, emotional, and economic harm on its victims. My name is Tanisha Johnson, and I am one such victim. My perpetrator was Dr. Ricardo Cruciani. He was a world-renowned neurologist at Beth Israel, Mount Sinai here in New York. He used his prominence, his prescribing of massive amounts of addicted opioids and my own shame and fear that I wouldn't be believed and it kept me quiet for years. Sexual assault victims like me are kept quiet for these reasons and many other reasons you will hear today. We need laws which permit victims to come forward on their own terms. Only now, many years later in my journey, can I talk about it. I've learned that the statute of limitations is a set time for someone to come forward and act under the law. I am here to tell you that a victim doesn't have a set time for when they can come forward. A victim doesn't have a set time when they go from being a victim to a survivor. A victim shouldn't have a set time to confront their perpetrator and their employers who shield them. Not changing the statute of limitations only helps criminals and those who facilitate those crimes. Not changing the statute of limitations helps criminals hide and continue to harm more victims. Not changing the statute of limitations only hurts victims like me. Please pass the amendment to allow the window for justice to be pursued by all victims of gender motivated violence. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we will hear from Ingrid H. Time starts now. Ingrid, if you see a, a button asking to unmute yourself. All right, uh, we will hold Ingrid for a later panel and we will move on uh, to see if any council members have any questions for this panel before we move on to the next panel. All right. I, I just wanna just thank this panel for, and, 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 and the previous panels for your um, remarkable courage in, in 
um, testifying at this hearing um, and for um, uh, telling your story. Thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, for the next panel, we will hear from uh, Jane Doe, uh, followed by Dan Sheffy, then Kat Rajnath, and then Farzana Farouk. If I have yet to call your name, I will make a call after this panel for anyone that I have missed. Um, Observer Jane Doe, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time and all the hard work that's gone into this amendment of the Gender Motivated Violence Act to create a two-year look back window for survivors. For the last six years plus, I've been known as Jane Doe number 21. Shame is one of the biggest emotions to have to manage and it is central to surviving sexual crime. Perpetrators know this. This knowledge effectively leverages sec sexual predators. The entire judicial process leverages sexual predators. Please take my case as an example. Dozens of women sought medical care for themselves and their unborn babies and were sexually violated by their obstetrician. Who exactly can comprehend and assimilate this fact that you cannot trust your obstetrician? Are you brave enough to cast a hard shadow over the birth of your brand new baby? Are you brave enough to enter into contentious legal proceedings and take joy away from the imminent birth of your newborn? Take joy away from all others closest to you? Shame is an insidious obstacle. It is haunting. No newborn mother wants to report sexual predation by her doctor committed during the most vulnerable, mo vulnerable moments of seeking medical help. For victims of Dr. Haddon, the biggest humiliations happened during the great moments of greatest trust. And Dr. Haddon knew that, that was his pattern. It was absolutely intrinsic to his crimes. It motivated his crimes. He knew his victims would be trapped by his crimes, by the shame of reporting such travesty right at the most meaningful and important moments of their lives. Can you imagine what this is like, undergoing the abject sadism of an obstetrician? And by extension, can you comprehend the sadism of any sexual predator? But you can use the example of my case and others as a template for gender motivated crimes. As a survivor, coming to terms with sexual abuse can take time to process and find the courage to speak out. Because of this, I urge you to please support an amendment to the Gender Motivated Violence Act to create a two-year look back window for all gender motivated crimes. Again, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to just mention I made a mistake. Uh, a few of the names I've mentioned have already signed off. And so next we are gonna hear from Dan Sheffy. Then I'm gonna make another call for Ingrid H and then I'll make another call to see if I missed anyone else. Dan Shafi, you may begin once the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the committee chairs and to the staff who've been so generously supportive and helpful. And thank you to council members Rivera and Brooks Hopkins for advancing this important legislation. I'm here to present testimony into the record on behalf of Marty Gould Cummings, former city council candidate. They are out of the country this week and requested that I present their testimony on behalf, on their behalf and on behalf of a broad co coalition of support from the city council co-sponsors, as well as from the LGBTQA communities of New York City. I'm grateful to Marty for their support. To the members of the city, New York City Council Women and Gender Equity Committee, it is time to stand up and support LGBTQIA people who have been impacted by gender-based and gender-motivated violence. I firmly support the bill intro 2372 and the pending revisions to the Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act. I support survivors and as a sexual assault survivor, I know firsthand the importance of being heard 
and being believed. This legislation will empower victims to come forward, to be heard, and no matter their gender identity or sexual orientation. Sincerely submitted, Marty Gould, Alan Cummings. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to ask Ingrid if she is available. Seeing that Ingrid is unresponsive to the unmute requests, um, if I have missed anyone, please use the raise hand function in Zoom now so that we can call for additional witnesses to testify. Okay, I see Eric Agarijo. Uh, you may test if you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz, Chair Levin, and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for holding this important meeting and providing us the opportunity to submit testimony. Uh, my name is Eric Agarijo, and I am the Communications and Special Events Manager for the Korean American Family Service Center. KFSC is a nonprofit organization that provides social services to Korean Asian immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by gender-based violence, sexual assault, and child abuse for the past 32 years. All of our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. 98% of our clients are immigrants and 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. Over 95% of our clients' first language is not English and come from low income backgrounds. During New York State on pause and throughout the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis, KFSC responded to a 300% increase in calls to our 24 hour bilingual hotline. 88% of these calls were related to domestic violence, sexual assault and child abuse. In 2020, we responded to over 4,000 hotline calls and KFSC served 1,201 survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and provided over 20,000 services related to domestic violence and sexual assault. As a direct service provided to all those who are affected by gender-based violence, sexual assault, and child abuse, harassment falls along a spectrum of violence. It is seen as a gateway to crime. Sexual harassment is often the first sexual experience for young women as street harassment is harmful and serious. Street harassment also relates to violence because it can cause re-triggering and especially upsetting for our survivors. As a direct organization that serves gender-based violence survivors, we realize the importance of gender-based street harassment. People should not be harassed because of factors like race, nationality, religion, disability, or class. Harassment can come from a form of power and control, and no form of harassment is ever okay. Everyone should be treated with respect, dignity, and empathy. Street harassment is a human rights issue, and KFS we stand in solidarity with our community partners, leaders today, to the passage of intro 2424. This would be a milestone achievement demonstrating this for our safety and peace. And thank you very much for allowing me to testify, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to mention that I also see um, we have been rejoined by Diana Prashat, uh, I'm sorry, Shari Deutsch. And then I'll try again for Ingrid and then we'll uh, address other hands that have been raised. Um, Shari Deutsch, you may begin once the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Uh, Sherry Deutsch, if you see an unmute request. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. You may begin. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm in transit at the moment. But um, to read my testimony, my name is Sherry Deutsch. I'm a former, former patient of Dr. Robert Haddon. And sorry about this. I'm looking for my notes. 
I seem to have lost them. Here we go. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my story today. I moved to New York City in 1999 at the age of 24, excited to live in the city where my parents grew up, Brooklyn and the Bronx. I was referred to Dr. Haddon by my GP and was thrilled to see a gynecologist that works for such a respected institution. I went to see Dr. Haddon for typical gynecological health concerns, as well as my strong family history of breast cancer. He used my fears to convince me that I should I think All Sherry the credentials lost required. Hello? Sherry, we lost you for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'll start the paragraph again. Um, I went to see Dr. Haddon for typical gynecological health concerns as well as my strong history of breast cancer. Sherry, you dropped off again um, after the word cancer. I think she's uh, dropped off of the uh, Zoom. Sorry. Just give her one more moment. Okay, uh, we will try and circle back to Sherry um, if and when she rejoins. Next, I would like to call on, I believe Diana, I believe Susan Kremiller, someone, maybe you have the wrong name listed. Um, can we unmute Susan and see? Hi, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that Kat Rajnoff is available to testify and has rejoined. Uh, I see Kat has her yes. hand raised now. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Okay, we will now move on to Kat Rajnoff. Time starts now. Kat, if you see an unmute uh, request, please hit that button to testify. Hi, my name is Kat Rajanoff. I'm a transgender woman raised in New York. Um, I'm 42 years old. I identified as trans since I was five years old, not knowing if something was wrong with me or wrong with others on how they felt about me. 37 years later, realizing that nothing was never wrong with me, it's just um, the people who identified me as being different. Speaking from uh, my experience as a transgender woman uh, over the years, I'm so nervous, y'all, um, to be honest. <laughs> but I have experienced a lot in... Um, in the HRA um, shelter system and the DHS shelter system. Um, take your time, Mrs. Councilwoman Diaz, please. Take your time, um, order. take it. This is your okay. opportunity to share your story with us. We're not judging, we're not criticizing. You wanna gather a society has impacted you and how we could make it better for you and for others in your situation. So please take your time if you need to. Okay. Um, Please. Okay, I'm going to try to read what I wrote. 37 years um, later, realizing nothing was ever wrong with me, but something was wrong with the people who viewed me as being different, weird, gay, fag, or trans, or a drag queen. So soon I realized um, I didn't fit anywhere. Speaking as a transgender woman two, year, um, two decades later, I've only uh, been looked at and used in a sexual form in the last three decades. There has been minimum job opportunities for transgender women other than sex work, such as um, Backpage, Craigslist, Eros, Twitter, Snapchat, OnlyFans, and Facebook. It exposes our LGBT community high to high rates of sexual violence and abuse. Um, every day we're exploited in our community. In 2021, the world we live in still doesn't understand gender at all. Here is a brief um, experience of 
what I go through. In 2019, I went to apply for my um, driver's license to renew my license um, here in New York. And I was told that I had to take female off my license because I did not have a sex change. After having my license like this for 10 years where it stated female due to the fact that I went to Dubai in 2010 and was arrested and held for 14 days in a country in a in a in a country in a room with no toilet bowl just a hole in the floor for me to urinate and piss and poop in um just because of my gender and to have that changed um back to being um, male because of the laws here in New York um was really horrible for me um, moving on to registering my kids here in 2020 and um, September 2020, um, also being a parent of three kids, uh, my two daughters. Um, I was denied registration of registering my kids once they found out that I was actually um, the biological father and not the mother of the kids. Um, they wanted me to prove basically that I should have had custody of the kids or the kids should have been with me. Only when I got involved, Ms. Susan Crummiller and Benjamin Pachesky was when they allowed my kids to register for school. My 10 year old daughter who now identifies as a male other than female has been through so much dealing with her identity and being scared as a kid. Um, also coming home at nine years old, peeing on herself due to the fact that she couldn't use the bathroom at her school because she was being called the transformer. Um, located here in Quorum Elementary School where we reside at now. I myself have been targeted in different places like Best Buy, Best Buy Smith Haven Mall just from using a gift card. I feel now that um, I guess that's the new way of targeting black people while being black in America. Not only that, having HIV and being diagnosed um, January 1st for New Year's as um, January 1st of 2018, that was my New Year's gift to have my Medicaid cut off last month or since November or my uh, all my benefits was cut off um, during the pandemic and still is cut off right now as of January, once this new law kicks back and I'll be going back to DH, um, DHS shelters because I'm backed up in 10,000 in rent, which uh -huh. um, HASA has refused to pay and has not paid. And I'm still fighting today. Um, it got to a point where last month, um, about two months ago, I couldn't even pay for my medication, which cost me $1,500 out of my pocket to pay. And I had to have a friend pay that, pay that for me just to have medication, a pill that I need to survive every day. I don't understand how in New York you're diagnosed with HIV and y'all have the audacity to cut off our Medicaid or the resources and the help that we have, like HIV is gonna leave our system tomorrow and we're gonna wake up HIV free. That's not what happens here. And if I didn't have the resources that I had to help me, I would have been just like any other trans woman who would have to turn back to sex work and going back into to the community of working. Putting these laws in place will not only help me and other people in the LG, um, LGBT community um, be more um, acceptable in society and also in public. I'm hoping that this um, law, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry, no, Ms. Susan. No, I got no, 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 don't be sorry. <laughs> no, nothing. You're a victim of circumstance. You're, you've been victimized over and over again. I'm, I'm sorry that, that our system has failed you. I'm just hoping that the system actually starts working better and don't fail anybody else moving forward. And I'm hoping that this law helps that in the best way it can. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. Don't be sorry. If, if I may, after this conversation today, please reach out to Chair Levin, um, Chair Rosenthal, or myself. Yes. It would be definitely at a place medically and, and housing that we have to make sure we get you on the right track and get you the leadership that can help you. And with HR tech, let y'all understand HRA and DHS, why people swap back and forth. HRA basically only allows you to be in that system for a little bit, but they also uh, push your case faster for you to get into a home where DHS enables you and keeps you uh, basically financed to stay in the shelter where some people get enabled and get comfortable with living like that. You understand? Y'all have to have a program that works for everybody to get out, a program that helps rehabilitate these people to want to get back out in the world and work instead of enabling them, keeping them sheltered. And you can't mix people from 
domestic with regular people because someone who is going through abuse and is scared to go outside, you can't have them in a regular shelter where people are already accustomed to being outside and are just dealing with homelessness, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Before becoming a council member, I worked 13 and a half years within the shelter system. And some of what you stated most recently in your last few sentences is what I've been trying to fight against as, as a council member and part of why we're having this conversation here today. This is not a, a one plan fits all for everybody, but if we have common denominators, common conversations, then that means we're doing something wrong and we have to figure out a better way. Yes. Thank you for, for depicting the difference between HRA and, and DHS. I'm sure many of my colleagues just see it as one system, but in reality, it's not. It's not at all. Which doesn't make an, a lot of sense to me either. Thank you. I think Chair Rosenthal has a maybe a question or a statement. Uh, before we turn to council member questions, I have a few more uh, people waiting to testify. Uh, can we, we see if, yes. Um, may I trouble you? I just wanna say one quick thing to the last panelist, um, just to thank her for coming forward and testifying. Um, Kat, you're a beautiful person. And um, I just want to make, I'm just, I'm sure you know this, but wanting to make sure that you know about the um, anti-violence project. It's just an amazing organization that I think um, might be a good resource for you. And just wanted to mention that. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Apologies. No problem. Uh, next, we'd like to turn to Ingrid, please. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you to the council, to Dharma Diaz, Chloe Rivera, and Anthony DiPietro for the opportunity to speak on the important topic of extending the statute of limitations for victims, survivors of gender motivated violence, domestic violence, and sexual harassment. I too am a former patient of Robert Haddon, former gynecologist in New York who abused his patients. The former doctor subjected me to sexual molestation, inappropriate breast exams, mental abuse, and performed what I now know was an unnecessary hysterectomy. He enjoyed hurting his patients and demoralizing them while presenting himself as a caring healthcare provider when he was in fact a sexual predator who used his position to gain access to women while at their most vulnerable. I am a plaintiff in a case related to him in the system that allowed him this access to victims for years. And he did these things to us very surreptitiously. I needed time and I needed the knowledge I now have in order to bring this to light and to join the lawsuit that's in place against him in Colombia. It's necessary to enable people to be able to come to terms with the abuse they've sustained and help make it less prevalent in our society. Many of us who have sustained sexual harassment, mistreatment, molestation, sexual assault in or out of the home or workplace are faced with many personal obstacles for reporting. Questions arise such as, will I be believed? Will I lose my job? Will my husband, will my partner still love me? Will my reputation be ruined? And how will I maintain my dignity at a time when I need it the absolute most? As individual responses to trauma vary greatly from person to person, depending on their history of prior abuse or victimization, and often a freeze response to trauma is experienced. It's not uncommon that a freeze response can temporarily render victims, survivors, unable to process what has happened to them. And there can be disassociation to trauma and that takes time to work through. Additionally, the legal system is quite lengthy and complicated. And for many of us who don't know where to start or have limited funds, it can be quite overwhelming. So time is needed in order to ethically, humanely, empathically ensure that the voices of of us victims and those who are victimized uh, are hurt. I speak as someone who has experienced sexual harassment, molestation, assault, both in and out of the workplace. And I had had, more, had I had more time to process what happened to me, I might've been able to have my voice heard more in those uh, cases to help change things for the better or for the next survivor. And I hope by speaking up today, I can help now. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, for the next panel, uh, before I turn to the next panel, I just want to name everyone so they know that their next Sherry Deutsch will revisit. Um, then we have an anonymous speaker and then Marissa Hoshetter. Um, chairs, do you have any questions for this panel before we move on? Or any other council member questions? Uh, yes, has no questions. I'm just mortified to, to hear that professionals, doctors, that we, we entrust our bodies to think it's okay. And there's a system knowing of it allowed it to continue. Yeah. This just cannot be. I, I'm sorry, I'm just moved over and over again. And the stories just get that much more horrific. I'm sorry, Chloe, you can move on. No, thank you, Chair Diaz. Uh, so next we'll move to the, uh, Sherry Deutsch. You may begin once the Sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. So again, my name is Sherry Deutsch. I'm sorry for the audio issues. I am, as I said, a bit in transit right now. As I said, I'm a former patient of Dr. Haddon. Um, I began seeing him in 1999 when I moved to in New York City. And it was very important to me to go see him because he was a member of such a, an important and well-loved institution. And I myself had great concerns about my risk for breast cancer due to my family history. And he, he was able to convince me that I needed to come in for a pelvic exam every six months, which was completely unnecessary and therefore allowed him basically to penetrate me an additional time a year for his own pleasure. In addition, I had a colposcopy done and we're not entirely sure if that was necessary. And so as I look back, I realized he was overly friendly. He did his best to groom me. He was like, we don't need a nurse in here, do we? And of course I was no, because this was someone I trusted with my health. And it was unfortunately not exactly obviously as it seemed, but the worst part about it is that Columbia knew about it and did nothing. And they could have prevented this from happening. They could have prevented my future panic attacks every time I go to the doctor. And I know my story is just one of many. And until we send a signal again to these institutions that they need to stop protecting these men or to be, stop protecting the people who are harming someone who comes to them for help, nothing is going to change. So I said, it's evident by what happened at USC and UCLA. This is not an isolated incident. And I think as New York has always been a leader in progressive policy, this would be an excellent opportunity to shine a spotlight on these type of abusers again and to put institutions on notice so that they know that they will lose far more by harboring such a person than they will by throwing them out. So um, again, I'm sorry for the audio issues and thank you again for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from an anonymous witness. You may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Am I, oh, am I free to speak? <clears throat> yes, you may begin. Okay. I am also just like the uh, former two ladies, a uh, former patient of Robert Haddon. <clears throat> and the multiple levels uh, for the involvement of this. <clears throat> I sought out Columbia because I was at advanced maternal age having a child and they are known as uh, the most technologically advanced healthcare system, uh, especially in New York. And I felt very lucky to be there and have access to it. <clears throat> so I sought them out specifically for that. I did not, I had never heard of Robert Haddon. I went to Columbia Medical uh, obstetrician group. And there, when I called, they assigned me to Dr. Haddon. So my first step was, was going towards Columbia for having the respect of their reputation <clears throat> and their technologies. Um, so it was there that I experienced uh, the sexual assault and molestation of Dr. Haddon many times. Um, I, the reason I say many times is because I had also phoned Blue Cross Blue Shield of New York 
um, after the first incident uh, and said, I need to switch my, um, my obstetrician and this is why. And they said, I'm sorry, it's against New York state law to switch in mid pregnancy. Um, no obstetrician will take you. You have to stay where you are. So I was forced then to stay and, and submit myself to these recurring uh, inappropriate advances and molestation and uh, just so that I would be able to have a healthy child, which is absolutely horrendous, inappropriate. I mean, just I, I, I almost lose words for what I had to go through with this just because there were so many levels of failure where this could have been stopped. From what I understand, Columbia knew about this for years and years before my occurrence was in 2011. And because I had pressure to be silent, I'm also a healthcare provider. Um, I also had a practice in New York and I felt very worried about how this was going to look upon me um, had I come out and said something. Um, so I just buried it and buried it really deeply. And I wasn't able to process it and work through it until well after um, I had experienced the experiences that I went through. So if the one thing that I can say, which is really important to amend this law, is that when you have these, these deeply um, these deeply psychologically abusing situations, people take their own time to be able to work them out. And it's whatever that person can manage uh, psychologically. And they, these things are thwarted for reasons so that you can function and carry on. And I was a new mom to a new baby. I didn't have time to deal with my feelings of shame or guilt or any inappropriate feelings that I may have been feeling other than feeling like a victim. And if anybody knows me, I'm an extremely strong woman. I'm not the woman that you find in the corner crawled up crying. Um, and this broke me. This was really horrendous, but it broke me years later. Um, we should all have our path to justice. Our path to justice is also our form of, of closure and dealing with it and healing from it. And I think that's one of the most important things that there must always be a path for justice, for healing against wrongdoing, and it ought not have statute of limitations or time limits. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we will hear from Marissa Hoshetter. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Marissa Hoshetter. I also want to thank the chairs for um, hearing testimony today about the Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act and to thank um, council members Rivera and Brooks Powers for introducing the legislation. But um, most importantly, I want to thank my other sister survivors who are sharing um, just incredible testimony today um, about what sexual assault looks like and um, the trauma that it, and the trail that it leaves in our lives. Um, so um, I also was sexually assaulted by Robert Haddon, including when I was pregnant with my twin girls. I reported the crimes against me to law enforcement and was failed by a system that bends to those in power and privilege. I wanted to be heard. I wanted to protect others. Instead, I was gaslit and cast aside. My experience with law enforcement meant that I really lost precious time, um, my courage, and so much more. I know now that what happened to me and hundreds of other women, many whom you've heard from today, happened repeatedly over decades at Columbia University and New York Presbyterian Hospital because institutions will always protect themselves first. Their own reputation, profits, and liability almost always went out over survivors' humanity. Without time to process the trauma or find resources and support, and without the validation of law enforcement, too many survivors are left with little to no recourse. We know that those with access to power will use it to protect themselves. And so the imbalance grows, abusers are emboldened, and too many people continue to look away. It keeps happening though, because we let them. And I will really ask the, the council and the committee to think carefully, like, are we really that weak that we're willing to let the same story play out of us in front of us over and over again with the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts, universities, doctor's offices, all kinds of workplaces. We know people need more time, um, especially to surface the true nature of serial crimes that happen in these institutions. There's no way to have a true public reckoning for sexual assault without access to justice and institutional accountability. And uh, the changes to the Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act provides a window for victims to regain their voice 
uh, and the amendment would open up the statute of limitations, providing a path for victims and survivors, no matter when the abuse occurred. I share my story of survivorship and failure by law enforcement, not because I want pity, but because I want to be productive. I'm tired of gender-based violence not being a real priority for elected officials. It is a through line through many forms of corruption across race and class and for far too many people in the city. Meaningful change means giving survivors options. Most importantly, it means offering them more time. This legislation does that. It's not enough to just say that you support us. Government must take actions to lift our voices, protect us, and hold accountable those complicit in our abuse. Council Member Rivera and Council Member Brooks Powers, along with many, many colleagues, many of you who've signed on as co-sponsors, are showing people that they're willing to mm -hmm. make meaningful action to give survivors a chance to get their voice back. I respectfully ask the committee and the council to support intro 2372. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Marissa Hawksetter. Sorry for mispronouncing your last name. If I have inadvertently missed anyone else who would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom now. Seeing no additional witnesses, I'd like to turn it to Chair Diaz for questions for this panel. I, I have no questions. Great. Uh, and Chair Levin, and if any other council members have any questions, please, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Seeing no additional questions from council members or Chair Levin, I've, uh, we, are, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Chair Diaz. I, I wanna begin by, by thanking my colleagues for introducing the bills, for going outside the box and letting the community, the residents tell their story and transition a basic conversation into law. Right, that, that's, what, that's our role and our responsibility. Thank you for the advocates. Thank you for the individuals that found the strength to tell your stories. Um, I also exit on December 31st, and I hope that my colleagues on my week, the, the former the incoming council, pay attention to recordings such as this nature. It's, it's our job and it's our duty to serve the underserved. And in closing, I again, I could just, Thank you all for being part of the process. I, I, I walked into this conversation strictly thinking about domestic violence and, and the effects of it. And I walk away a much stronger a person for it, a more knowledgeable individual as, as I move on and act and advocate you know, for, for your issues. Again, thank you, thank you, Chloe and, and the staff for putting this together. It is two, two o'clock with, with 19 minutes. Thank you, and I want to thank the administration for at least staying through half of today's conversation. Often the administration would leave, but till about an hour ago, we did have an admin person with us. I believe- Yeah, before, uh, before you adjourn, oh, yes. before you adjourn, uh, Chair, I just wanted to um, uh, express my gratitude to everybody, in particular the last several, um, uh, panels of survivors who testified um, and um, uh, shared with us their their very personal experiences, um, but it's, it's so important um, for us to get um, for the city to hear uh, these stories and make sure that public policy um, responds to that to the um, uh, to the to the moral challenge that um, that your stories. Uh, presented to us. And so I, I, I just thank you um, uh, from the bottom of my heart for your courage and, and your testimony. Thank you. I'm not seeing Councilman Rosenthal. Is she still on? No, just the chairs. Just the chairs? Well, she's also a chair somewhere else, no? <laughs> but again, I... I Sergeant Perez, I'm going to end it with, with our um, traditional safita maker. But uh, my, my, my staff on this side, um, thank you, Terry Coxon, for bringing me back around to focus. While being a member of the council, I thought deep in heart and obsessed, what do I see that we're lacking? 
And I, I leave this council having introduced the bill 237079 that discusses men, the men and, and the roles that men play in society uh, and how difficult it is as well for a man who's been raised, don't cry, be strong and be tough to be victimized and, and have to chuck it up to experience is not to take away from any women. Please, I don't want my bill to be seen as that. As a survivor, I know better. My goal is to change the system. My, my daughter's father, I look back and say like, he loved me, he didn't know how to love me. He came from a broken home where his mom was also a victim. My desire is to change where our little people grow up and where they think is natural. And in my heart of hearts, I feel that introduction of Bill 2379 could help change that. Someone mentioned earlier, we learn by what we see. Society has to do better. We have to figure out what makes men victimize women and why women victimize, right? So again, this Bill 211, I thank you for, for supporting me on, on my bill. I'm, I'm trying to change the conversation. We have men that are broken and we have to figure out a way. The doctor that you spoke of, obviously he was, there's something wrong with him. And I, I would love to know what empowered him to think that it was okay to do this over and over and over again. Again, thank you all for hearing me out. Chloe, thank you. She worked over the weekend with me for deliverance today. Thank you all. Sergeant.